We are on the record in the Iowa District Court for Jefferson County. We are here on case FECR 005143. It's captioned the State of Iowa versus Willard Noble Chaden Miller. Present for today's sentencing hearing is the defendant, Mr. Miller, along with his attorneys, Christine Branstead and Nathan Olson. Uh, the State of Iowa is represented by Jefferson County Attorney Chauncey Molding and Assistant Iowa Attorney General Scott Brown. The record in this case shows that on the 18th day of April, the defendant entered a plea. Uh, and Mr. Miller entered pleas to the crime of murder in the first degree, which is a Class A felony. Pursuant to Iowa Code Section 7071 and 707.21a, that uh, based on the fact that uh, Mr. Miller was a juvenile at the time that this crime uh, he committed, uh, he was a juvenile, um, the parties agreed and the court ordered that a pre-sentence investigation be prepared and submitted uh, to the parties and to the court. Uh, Mr. Molding or Mr. Brown, has the state received a copy of the PSI? We have, Your Honor. And do you have any additions, corrections, deletions, or objections to its use? No, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Brand said uh, regarding the pre-sentence investigation, what record would you like to make? Your Honor, um, we have no objection to the use of the PSI uh, with regard to corrections. Uh, I believe that sentencing memo has now been filed and that sets out a number of minor corrections, uh, ranging from, uh, I think that within the PSI gives my client's height at arrest, which was five foot six, he's now six foot four, uh, to some uh, corrections as to my client's perception of uh, some minor notes within the uh, PSI. None of those should interfere with this court's ability to use the PSI. Uh, and to rely on the PSI for sentencing. And um, has this, did the state receive a copy of the sentencing memo? Judge, there's been a reference to the sentencing memo uh, here on the record as well as prior to coming in here this morning a few minutes ago. Um, I do not have a copy of that yet. I'm not sure when it was filed, but um, I don't see any reason why we can't proceed uh, regardless. I, I just printed out the paper copy for counsel and myself. Um, I don't know. If, so I'll give you guys, Thank everybody you. has a copy of it. And Your Honor, I did just hand my computer to Mr. Molden to review those corrections. And he had an opportunity to look through those. should not be pronounced uh, today against Mr. Miller? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. And Mr. Miller, do you know of any legal reason why I shouldn't sentence you today? No, Your Honor. With regard to uh, the sentencing hearing, 
uh, allow the state to uh, put on its evidence and argument first. Then the defense will have an opportunity to do the same. Uh, Mr. Miller will have an opportunity if he wishes to make a statement before sentencing, but it's not a requirement. And then we'll have any victim impact statements um, read at, after um, all those things occur. But uh, we'll start with the state. And uh, is there any evidence you'd like to offer this time, counsel? There is, Judge. If I could just briefly outline that for the court so you kind of know what you're in for, if uh, that's OK. Go ahead. Um, so it's our intention uh, in, in uh, our presentation to offer four witnesses. Uh, Trent uh, Bellina, who is the uh, DCI agent, who was the assigned case agent uh, for the investigation of the death of uh, Noe McGraver. Uh, he will testify to kind of give the court and everyone an overview of the investigation and the evidence uh, that was collected by law enforcement. Uh, secondly, we we're going to call uh, Special Agent DCI Special Agent Ryan Kedley, who will provide a summary of the interviews of both. Uh, the defendant, uh, Willard Miller, as well as the co-defendant, Jeremy Goodale. Uh, we do have some excerpts from those um, interviews that we will play for the court. Uh, total minutes on the excerpts was uh, right around 50 minutes, I believe. Uh, thirdly, we're going to call uh, Fairfield Police Officer Julie Kinsella, who was the lead uh, officer and detective that assisted with the investigation into the death of uh, Noe McGregor. And then lastly, we're going to call Mike Heinrichy, um, H-E-I-N-R-I-C-Y, uh, who is the warden of Iowa Medical and Classification Center at Oakdale, which is the reception center the court is aware for all prisoners. He also was uh, one of the persons that spearheaded uh, the youthful offender program uh, at Oakdale, because uh, it is our understanding that uh, whenever the defendant goes to prison, he will initially be in that program. Uh, so I think he has some relevant information to offer, not only initially with the, uh, the youthful offender program, but then what it may be in store uh, for the defendant, uh, depending on his length of sentence uh, that the court imposes on him. Um, so that's our presentation of our evidence. We also have, well, one other thing that I might mention as the court is aware, uh, under these circumstances, and since the defendant was under the age of 18, uh, whenever he, would, he committed the crime that he's pled guilty to, um, Iowa Code Section 902.1 sub 2B2A provides a number of factors for the court to consider in fashioning an appropriate sentence. I won't go through all those factors uh, for the court. I know that you're well aware of those. Uh, but all of our evidence that we have today will impact one or more of those factors that the court has to consider in fashioning uh, the sentence for uh, the defendant. Um, we are going to be recommending at the close of all the evidence today, whenever we do make our sentencing recommendation, uh, that uh, the defendant, Willard Miller, be sentenced to a term of life with the possibility of parole and that he be uh, made to serve a 30-year minimum sentence before he is eligible for parole. Uh, that was our agreement with the uh, defense. Of course, they can make any recommendation that is uh, legally uh, available to them, uh, but that, that's what the state will be recommending in, in this case. And lastly, before I call any of our witnesses, Judge, we do have a number of exhibits that we are going to be offering. Uh, for the record here, we have numbered them 100 through 133. Uh, inclusive of all those numbers, uh, we have provided an exhibit list to the court, which details what those exhibits are, describes them for the court. Um, we would offer those collectively at this time, exhibits 100 through 133. Um, there are several photos in that, uh, on that exhibit list that uh, show Noe McGraver at the railroad tracks where she was found, they're not pleasant pictures to look at. Um, I know some of the family here has been uh, notified of that. I'm not sure all of them have. So uh, by way of this statement, we're letting them know that. And those pictures are uh, 123, 124, 125, and 126. 
uh, that, so there are four, I believe. So just by, by way of no, noting those for the record, so we would offer uh, those exhibits at this time, and then we would be prepared to call our first witness. Thank you. Regarding the exhibits offered by the state. Your Honor, uh, we do object to exactly the photos just referenced by the state. That's 123 through 126. Uh, Your Honor, those are not probative on any issue of sentencing. Uh, I understand that the state's argument is that those would go to the nature of the crime, but the photos don't um, depict anything not within the autopsy report, not within testimony, um, and in this case are unfairly prejudicial. If the court accepts uh, the photos, we would ask that the, the court limit publication of those within this courtroom. Uh, certainly there is uh, nothing that must be publicly viewed in order for the court to make whatever consideration the court makes and uh, charging the situation even more within the courtroom does present a danger of unfair prejudice. Mr. Brown, you would offer exhibit state exhibits 100 through 126 at this time? Correct. Judge, if I may, just for the record. Go ahead. Uh, part of the, the factors under the code section, I'm, I might, may I remain seated? I don't mean to be disrespectful. No, okay. Uh, the, the factors under 902.1 that you know, the, the photos that we're offering uh, goes to um, would be the severity of the offense, the nature of the offense, the heinous, brutal, cruel manner of the murder, uh, and the, the um, if I didn't mention severity of the offense, it goes to that factor as well. So it, it impacts several factors under 902.1. Um, I would tell the court that there are a number of pictures uh, that we have. We have limited this to four. Uh, photos. We're also offering the autopsy report as part of our exhibit list. Uh, but all of those things, I know they're not pleasant to look at. I understand that. But that should not keep them uh, from the court's consideration or from the public's view uh, since this is a public hearing. So we would uh, resist the defendant's objection on those grounds as well. Any further record we need to make on those exhibits? Your Honor, um, just I understand that the the rules of evidence are not the same within a sentencing procedure, but the constitutional protections are still uh, fine. I think that's within Gideon versus Wainwright. Uh, and Your Honor, creating that um, publishing those photos does not serve any significant um, aspect of sentencing, even within showing the severity of the crime day, the photos don't depict anything that, that really shows much about the crime. It just, they're just very sad photos. And it creates the danger, again, of creation an emotional charge within the courtroom. I'll, uh, over the objection of uh, defense, I'll admit states exhibits 123 through 126, and I'll admit 100 through 122 without objection. Um, did, did the state have any objection to the defense's exhibits? No, we were provided a fairly comprehensive list of the exhibits they had. I don't think we had any objection to any of them. Judge, I want to make sure we're clear on numbers. Your Honor, you admitted um, all the exhibits up to 126. The state has also offered 127 through 133, which are the autopsy report and video uh, records, as well as some evidence from the defendant's cell phone and some transcripts. And the defendant's position on the admission of those exhibits? One 
Your Honor, we don't object to admission. Um, certainly there's argument to be made as to the weight to be given by the court. Um, this is an unsworn statement um, and the, the uh, speaker is not available for cross-examination. Um, I think without uh, the ability to confront that statement, minimal weight should be given, but we don't object to its admission. One moment, Your Honor, I'm sorry. And Your Honor, that's to both uh, 129 and 123, which are essentially the same thing as the video and the transcript. I see 127, I don't see 129. Is that, is there a 129, Mr. Moore? There is, Your Honor. Uh, 129 is a video interview with uh, Defendant Jeremy Goodale. Okay. Judge, the, obviously the videos we can't upload, that may be what you're looking at. We have those on a flash drive uh, here for the court, so it's both, both interviews in, in their entirety. Is it the same videos offered during the suppression hearing? Uh, the Miller uh, interview would be the same one, okay. uh, but the uh, interview of Goodale, I don't believe has ever been offered in any hearing, not to my recollection. Um, he had proffered with the state in February of this year. Um, that's that interview, it's a little over two hours uh, in length. Well, I will admit states 127, 130, 131, 132 and 133 and I'll admit exhibit 129 is there a 128 128 is the video interview of the defendant Miller okay yeah so I've already watched that but um, I will admit that as well um, and give it the way I believe it deserves regarding the defense exhibits I believe it's mm uh, through yeah, MMM, triple M through triple Z, and then um, quadruple A through quadruple C. Any objection to those exhibits uh, from the state? Your Honor, may I be heard? Could, um, we have not offered those yet, um, and I'd like to wait until our evidence begins. Um, we may limit some of those. Okay. Is the state ready to proceed with uh, sentencing? We are, Judge. Okay, go ahead. Our first witness is uh, Agent Trent Belda. You probably are going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and I'm going to do it. Please have a seat. Please uh, state your name for the record. My name is Trent Billeta. It's B as in Victor, I-L-E-T-A. And how are you employed? I'm a special agent with the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation. And how long have you been employed in that capacity? Uh, since 2006. All right, and where is your current assignment? I work for the Major Crimes Unit based out of Cedar Rapids. Can you describe for the record what the Major Crimes Unit, uh, what their function is? Sure. It's, uh, the, the Major Crimes Unit is essentially a violent crimes unit. Uh, we are uh, an assist agency, so we offer exp expertise in death cases, officer ball shootings, um, other violent crimes that maybe smaller departments won't have. And uh, so when something like a murder happens in a smaller community, we will work with that department um, during that investigation. Over the years, do you know how many uh, death investigations you've worked? Uh, I've, I've been asked that quite a few times. I'm not sure. A lot. No. All right. So in this particular uh, case involving the Lane Graver, uh, were you assigned to work the disappearance and ultimately the death investigation involving her? Yes, I was. And when did you get that call? Uh, we got that call on November 3rd, 
in the evening, uh, approximately 8.30 or so. Can you just describe for the court how that process occurs? Sure, when, as a request agency, we have to be requested by a police department, a sheriff's office, uh, county attorney's office. So my supervisor at the time received a call from the Fairfield Police Department regarding a missing person. Uh, as I was coming down towards Fairfield, uh, I was notified that the missing person's uh, body was located. And who was that? It was Noema Graber. So uh, about what time did you arrive here in Fairfield? It was sometime between 9.30 and 10 p.m. on November 3rd. And can you generally describe for the court how it was that Noema Graver had been located by local law enforcement? Uh, sure. The uh, Fairfield Police Department uh, took the initial missing persons report. They conducted a very thorough investigation as far as a missing persons uh, investigation goes. Uh, they had worked, I think, pretty much maybe 12 to 15 hours so far. Um, during their investigation, it was determined that uh, every day at 4 p.m., uh, Noe McGraver would go to Chautauqua Park and do three laps at the park. So they were able to determine that she was last seen at 4 p.m. on the 2nd, leaving the school, and it was a logical next step for them to search the park. And um, was there a vehicle that was associated with knowing McGraver? She had always drove a van, and that van was uh, seen entering the park around 4 p.m. on November 2nd. And you did mention that there was a surveillance video checked at the school to determine the exact time that she left on November 2nd. That is correct. There was video of her leaving uh, shortly before 4 on November 2nd. Right. Now, um, the report of Noema Graber's uh, disappearance did not come in until the following day on November 3rd, is that right? That, that's correct. Can you just generally describe for the court what the circumstances uh, of that particular uh, notification were? Uh, her uh, husband, Paul Graber, had come to the Fairfield Police Department, I believe around 8 in the morning after Noema did not return home on the 2nd. Had Paul Graber been out of town uh, on uh, November 2nd as well? That is correct. And did they live in the same house together here in Fairfield? They did. Uh, did anybody else live with them? Uh, they have a, a son that lives with them. Had you or other law enforcement uh, prior to knowing the Graber's being, prior to her being found, had anyone contacted the school to see if she had arrived for work on November 3rd or had been seen by uh, anyone at the school? Yeah. Um, yes, the, like I said, the Fairfield Police Department conducted a very thorough investigation and part of that would be to contact her. So tell us, uh, Agent Billiton, at the time that you arrived here on November 3rd in the evening, um, what was the status of the investigation at that point, uh, given that knowing McGregor had been located? So the, most of these uh, investigations, uh, they're unpredictable. You're not, you're not quite sure what you're stepping into. Um, the initial investigation as far as missing persons investigation was was done very well. Um, we had located Noy McGraver, or the police department had located Noy McGraver. Um, so uh, we knew that she was deceased. Uh, it was definitely suspicious that uh, when I had walked into the Fairfield Police Department, there was a whiteboard where the uh, Fairfield Police Department had collected statements that they had heard regarding uh, possible suspects. In the death of Noah McGregor. So, whenever you mentioned that it was a suspicious death, what was that based upon? It was based on how her body was located. She was in the woods. She was covered in a tarp with a wheelbarrow over the top of it, and then a 
railroad tie on top of the wheelbarrow. Um, all that would obviously indicate that Noemi McGregor was not able to do that herself. Someone else would have had to conceal her body. So at the time that you arrived at the Fairfield Police Department, was there one in particular person uh, that was present that ultimately provided you critical information in determining who was responsible for knowing McGregor's death? So, yes, when we got there, uh, like it was very fluid. There was a lot of information coming in. Uh, this wasn't an apartment we work with very often. So um, after we kind of got settled, uh, it was determined that about an hour earlier, John Burnett had come to the police department with information as to possibly who killed Noah McGregor. And what was John Burnett's relationship to either the defendant in this case or Jeremy Goodell? Uh, he was very good friends with both of them, probably a little closer to, to Jeremy Goodell, but he would have been in that friend group. All right, we'll get to John Burnett's information here in just a second, but I want to talk to you a bit about uh, location uh, where Noah McGraver was and some other information that relates to the crime scene. Uh, did you go out to Chautauqua Park? I did. All right, and um, well, let's back up just a second. Um, were you at some point provided a photo of what uh, Noah McGraver looked like prior to death? Yes. All right, I'm going to show you what's. Uh, we can put that up. Screen States Exhibit 100. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And what is that a photo of? That's a picture of Noah McGraver. It's one of her school photos, possibly her family picture. I, I always thought it was her school photo. Okay. This shows her in 2014 15, is that right? That's correct. Okay. All right, let's talk a bit about the area. Um, Agent Valletta, States Exhibit 101. Uh, can you see that photo? Yes, I can. Or this diagram? Yes. So on here is this loop uh, with a red, uh, with, it says Chautauqua Park, is that correct? That's correct. What does that loop represent? That's the walking path around the park. Okay. And then the uh, highway that is at the bottom of the diagram, is that the, one of the main highways through Fairfield? Yes, that's the uh, coming off uh, Highway 34, I think that's the business 34. So that'll bring you right into uh, Fairfield. And you have been to this location, is that right? That's correct. Uh, on here is uh, access, an, an indication of access to the railroad tracks. Do you see that? Yes. What What does that represent here on this particular exhibit? Yeah, the access to the railroad tracks is actually uh, a path. It's like, uh, uh, I don't know, I would call it like a truck path for maybe the railroad to do maintenance. So it's, uh, wide enough for a car to drive back to the railroad tracks. And there's also an arrow here near the railroad tracks that indicates body location. What does that represent? Yeah, that's where Noema Graver was found. Uh, there's a bridge there uh, over the railroad tracks. Below the bridge is a stream. Uh, Noema Graver would have been located maybe 10 meters or so uh, down from the railroad tracks. So it's a very steep incline and it's very wooded. That's where the body was. Uh, States Exhibit 102. Uh, did you ever go to the Miller or Goodell residence in Fairfield? I was at the Miller residence. Okay. And you're familiar with the location of the Goodell residence, I assume? That's correct. And that's what the, the set with this particular exhibit shows the location of both of those homes? That is correct, yes. Um, who lived at the Miller residence other than uh, the defendant? Uh, his mother and I, those were the only two that I was aware of that lived there. And Goodale, uh, do you know who lived at his residence other than Jeremy Goodale? I think it was his father. Um, I don't think his mother was around, but I'm not quite sure on that. Okay. And we've got a pointer up on the map now. 
Is this the area that we were just looking at in the previous exhibit that is Chautauqua Park? Yes, that's Chautauqua Park. Do you know roughly what the distance is to either of those residences uh, to Chautauqua Park? Uh, I would describe it as walking distance, uh, a little over a mile. Okay. State's Exhibit 103, uh, do you see that? Yes. Um, during the investigation, uh, was the vehicle driven by Noe McGraver located? Yes, it was. It was located, uh, as you see that arrow down at the bottom of the picture. Um, that's at the end of Middle Glasgow Road, which is a dead end. And at that end of the road, there's um, some trees and uh, a path for, I think, kids would go back there and mess around. So um, it was a well-known road, especially to the police department. How was it that law enforcement was able to locate Noe McGraver's vehicle? Uh, with some of the information that we were able to get from uh, John Burnett was that the vehicle was located at a dead end, dead end road. Um, Lieutenant Kinsella of the police department knew or had a very good idea what road they were describing, and she was the one that found the uh, vehicle. Right, and up here in the upper left-hand corner, that is Chautauqua Park that we were looking at in earlier exhibits, is that right? That's correct, yes. And what would be roughly the distance between the park and the location of the vehicle? Uh, like for driving, it's just a few minutes away. At the, uh, the search was done, well, let me back up. Did you learn the specific nature of the injuries inflicted upon Noe McGraver? Well, initially at the scene, um, I had uh, did a brief examination of the body. Part of the case agent's responsibility is to assess what kind of additional resources are needed. Uh, that usually entails us going to the scene. Uh, well, it doesn't usually. We always go to the scene to make that determination. Uh, I needed to observe uh, her body just to brief our crime scene team on kind of what they were getting into when they got there. My initial impression was is there was a severe head trauma. Uh, I did not observe any other injuries. Are you uh, familiar with the term blunt force injury? Yes. Is that what it appeared uh, knowing McGraver had suffered was a blunt force injury? That was my initial impression. Yes. And as a homicide detective, uh, what exactly does that mean to you? Uh, blood force traumas, uh, it, it can mean anything as far as, uh, in this case, it was a baseball bat, it could be a hammer, anything that would uh, be able to hit you hard enough to cause injury. And during the search of uh, Miller's residence, was any item found that would be consistent with an item that could cause blood force injury? Yes, there was a baseball bat located in the Miller residence. This is that state's exhibit 104, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, where was this exactly in the Miller residence? It was in uh, Willard Miller's room behind the chair. Okay. So this obviously photo was taken with the chair removed, is that right? Yeah, that's correct, yes. And I... So just to fast forward a bit, um, Jeremy Goodale was interviewed in this case, is that right? That's correct. Uh, did he provide an explanation in his interview that would be consistent with the description of this bat as being used to uh, cause the death of Noe McGraver? Yes, he described the bat that was used as having like flames or something on that, as you can see in the photo, that would uh, coincide with what we're looking at in the photo. And this bat would have been submitted to the DCI Crime Laboratory for DNA analysis, is that right? That's correct. Uh, did anything uh, come back positive that would have identified it as being directly associated with the death of Noe McGraver? Uh, no, I think it was speculated that it was cleaned pretty well. So let me, let me just ask you that. In your experience as a uh, law enforcement officer, can DNA be destroyed? Very easily, yes. It could be wiped down or cleaned. That would remove any trace of it, is that right? That's correct, yes. Let's move to the location of the, uh, the van that we've seen earlier in the overview of the map. This is State's Exhibit 105. Um, 
what do we do we see the uh, vehicle here in this picture? Yeah, so right, right where the red dot is, uh, you look above there, that's the license plate um, of the van. Uh, this picture also depicts, um, it was supposed to depict uh, the tire marks in that grass going back. So you can tell that there was uh, an effort made to conceal the van. And State's Exhibit 106 shows the van as well, is that right? That is correct, yeah. And whenever you talked about the attempt to conceal it, was it basically parked back into some trees and bushes? Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. And this would have been off the road how far, if you know? Uh, it's not too far off the road. It, it's, it's interesting because it's a long, dead-end road. Um, there's, so there only, the next closest house will be roughly maybe a quarter mile away. So they're limiting the exposure to, to traffic because of the dead end road, but again, it's a, kind of an area that people go to. While we're talking about the location of the van and where it was located off Old Glasgow Road, did you or other officers in the investigation develop information that both Miller and Goodale had been picked up on November 2nd uh, by another person? Yeah, yes, we did. Okay, was that person's name Habib Sain? Yes, it was. And uh, can you describe for the court what uh, Mr. Sain uh, informed law enforcement of? Yes, he uh, told law enforcement that approximately uh, 4.50 or so p.m. on November 2nd, he was contacted by Jeremy Goodale and asked for, um, for them to be picked up on Middle Glasgow Road. Um, we were able then to find camera footage which corroborated what Mr. Singh said. Um, it shows two males walking down the road and then Mr. Singh's car coming into a driveway to pick them up. And is the person that provided the surveillance video, is his name Ryan Ford? That's, yes. He just happened to live near the area? Yes, he would, would be the house that would be closest to the van. And just to make sure we're clear, Habib Singh is, was not involved in the death or disappearance of Noe McGraver, is that correct? We developed no information that would show that he had any involvement whatsoever. He just happened to be friends with both Miller and Goodell? But yes. <coughs> right. Let's move to the photos from Chautauqua Park. Uh, State's Exhibit 107, uh, what does that show us here? So that's going to be a path that will lead you. You're actually inside the park here. As you travel down towards the police vehicle, that would you'd be traveling towards the walking path. Okay. This would have been the walking path that you and other officers uh, would have been told that knowing a graver would take daily. Yes. It's, it's essentially a big loop around the park, is that right? Yeah, yes it is. And this is this state's exhibit 107 just shows a portion of that, is that right? Yeah, that would be the most likely entrance for her to enter onto the uh, walking path. Okay. Let's move down the path a bit. This is state's exhibit 108. This is more towards that police vehicle that we just saw in 107, is that right? Okay. Yes, sir. All right, this area here that has yellow tape, can you tell us what that represents? Okay, so now that would be, as I described earlier, the truck path that would lead you up to the railroad. Um, right to the right of uh, the far right of this picture, kind of below the crime scene tape, is where we believe that the uh, assault occurred. Was there evidence uh, that an assault had occurred in that area? Yeah, there was quite a bit of blood, um, kind of starting around that area and then along the path up to the railroad. And we can see the railroad tracks in this photo in the distance. Is that right, where the pointer is? Yes, that's what, those are the railroad tracks. And this is a, a what is that, like a dirt pathway, is that correct? Yes, that would be just be for a vehicle just to pull off. Um, and then, like I said, probably, I'm guessing it was maintenance vehicles that would go back there. And the, the main path here is actually uh, paved with asphalt, is that right? Yes. Okay, State's Exhibit 109, does that show the same area, just a little bit more to the, what would that be, to the east? I believe that would be to the east, and yes, that's so, now we're just looking more to the right of that last photograph. Um, again, probably 
at that curb area would, would be the most likely spot for the assault. And whenever you received the information from Jeremy Goodale, uh, did that match up with some of the things that we're seeing here in these photos? Yes, it did. As far as the physical locations, what I mean? Yes. Okay. State's Exhibit 110. Uh, is that just the opposite direction that we've been seeing in the other two photos? Yeah, so this is essentially looking at, you're standing at the crime scene tape looking up the hill. And State's Exhibit 111. Uh, that appears to be more, I believe that's uh, going further east and then you're looking more towards the path again. We can uh, see the crime scene area. tape, I think, vaguely yes. here in this photo, is that right? That's correct, yes. States Exhibit 112 again shows the crime scene tape, is that right? That's correct. Yes. And this is the same area? Yes. And is this where law enforcement made the determination that based upon the information that you had that no immigrator was attacked? Yes, um, our determination uh, kind of corroborated, did it kind of, our information did corrupt, was corroborated by Jeremy Goodell, as that being the location where they was sold. And there was also physical evidence, which I think you mentioned earlier, that was present in this general area that would have suggested that. So there was, a, yes, there was quite a bit of blood there. Um, as we move through these pictures, there's, uh, probably three separate times where it looked like uh, Noah McGregor's body had stopped moving where blood had collected. State's Exhibit 113, uh, where are we now moving towards the railroad tracks? Yes, so now we're more on to the path heading up towards the railroad tracks. And this is the crime scene tape here that we've used as a reference point in other photos, is that right? That's right. Exhibit 114, are we now beyond the crime scene tape, more towards the railroad tracks? Yes, so that again, that's depicting the uh, truck path or vehicle path. Um, in this area, turn oh, I'm sorry, going heading towards the body, I'm sorry. And in this, in this area here, would there have been other, uh, was there other evidence of, of blood that was in the grass? Yes, right around that, at the, uh, right past that curve, we would see then another significant amount of blood which would suggest that the body had rested there for a bit. And Exhibit 115 is the opposite uh, direction from the previous photo, is that right? That's correct. This gives us a little bit different perspective from the path, or back towards the path, would that be true? It's essentially looking at the bottom of the railroad tracks towards the path, yes. States Exhibit 116, what does that show us? So again, this, this would be the path um, at the far left uh, along the railroad tracks would be where the bridge is. And then the path itself will end essentially where uh, above the, where Noima <coughs> Graver's body was located. This would be towards where her body would have eventually been located, is that right? That's right. And State's Exhibit 117, is that just the opposite direction of the previous photo? Yes, that's just a, a perspective of looking at the switching ends, essentially. State's Exhibit 118, what does that show us? So now we're on top of the railroad tracks. Um, again, we find uh, some blood along there, not as much. Um, but uh, you'll see that, of course, the bridge going along there. So we're moving towards where my body was located. Is this the bridge that you referenced? Is that that is that the area I have a pointer on now? Yes, it is. And would it have been in this general area where the pointer is as to where Noah McGregor would have been eventually located? Yes. States Exhibit 119, what does this show? So it's a little hard to see from a distance, but right where that pointer is, you'll see uh, a bit of red, that would be the wheel barrel. So that's where her body is located. Can you describe for the court uh, what the importance was of the wheelbarrow as it relates to where she was found and how it may have been utilized? So the, the investigation uh, showed uh, several different times that a wheelbarrow was used to uh, essentially transport the body um, of Noah McGraver. Uh, it appeared that they didn't calculate 
uh, weight and what the wheelbarrow could hold. So the wheelbarrow essentially came apart, broke apart, um, which is, I, I could only speculate that's why it was left there. It would, would not have been easy to carry out. Um, but it was part of the plan to move her in that wheelbarrow. States Exhibit 120, uh, does that show that area that we just saw here in 119? You can see faint red in this picture. Is this a bit closer? Right, so that would be then the railroad tie on top of the wheelbarrow. Is this where the pointer is, what is that? That's the railroad tie. And then the red that we see in this photo, both above the tie and below, is what? That's the red wheelbarrow. Standing in this position, uh, would you know that a person is under that wheelbarrow or railroad tie? You can't. You cannot see her from there. <laughs> States Exhibit 121. Uh, what are we seeing in this photo? So. Uh, these are then the, would be the three items that were used to conceal a body. So you would have the wheel or the railroad tie up above, the wheelbarrow right below that, and then her body is actually located. It's wrapped in that uh, gray tarp uh, right to the left of the wheelbarrow where the red pointer is. And you were were you at this scene before Noe McGraver was recovered? Yes. Okay. Before anything had been disturbed. Uh, with regard to the wheelbarrow or the tarp or her body, is that right? That is right. Uh, whenever you were right next to it, could you see that a person was actually wrapped up in the tarp? When you were right next to you could see a shoe and I think a hand underneath, kind of popping out underneath. Okay. Um, just by way of warning for those in the courtroom, the next few photos uh, may be difficult to look at for some people. Your Honor, and I renew my objection to publication of those photos. Um, I believe that the court witness can look at how public publishing them to the uh, courtroom. Uh, overruled, uh, Mr. Brown. You can pay for the next photo. Uh, next photo is Exhibit 122, which shows a little bit closer area of 121. Do um, you see that? Yes. So again, that would be your tarp. Um, now that you know that there's a body under there, you can kind of close, as you look closer, you can kind of see where she would be located again, um, where the red pointer is. Um, and like I said, there was just a couple of small pieces of, or bits of body part that we could see at that time. So um, I had to make the determination to lift the tarp to, to get a closer look at her. So when Noe McGraver's head had been under the area where we see the area here where the uh, red wheelbarrow is? Yes. And then what looks, it appears to me to be jeans or some sort of pants. That's what I'm, it's showing here on the pointer, if that be true? Yes. Okay. Was the wheelbarrow uh, removed? Yes. Uh, before you opened the tarp? Yes. Okay, that's what the next photo shows. Um, is that what we see here? Yes. So the wheelbarrow's now been removed? Yeah, it's, you can see it kind of at the bottom right corner. Right down here? Sure. Yes. Okay. And then this area to the right hand corner of the photo is what? That's the uh, where the pointer is right now, that's a railroad tie. And then that's how her body that was wrapped in the, in the tarp. So did you or members of the crime scene team then unwrap the tarp? So, yes, the crime scene team was there. Um, I was there with a couple other people. And uh, so we unwrapped the tarp so they could photograph it while we were doing that. Okay. And whenever you unwrapped the tarp, uh, knowing McGregor was there, correct? Correct. Was she dressed? Uh, partially. Can you describe that, please? She uh, uh, was just wearing a bra. Uh, her pants were kind of down around her ankles. Uh, it was pretty easy and when we were standing there, we started looking around, we could see that like, uh, I think she had a turtleneck sweater was um, up in the trees, had been thrown up in the trees. And another shirt had been thrown up in the trees. Uh, they weren't well, well hidden, but she was partially nude when we uh, recovered her. 
Exhibit 124 shows the body of Noah Graber head to toe. Is that correct? It, yes. It, well, it's coming up here. I just want to make sure everybody's aware it's coming. This is Noah Graber. Is that right? That's correct. And um, were you able to get a view of the wound to her head while you were there? Yes, I think the next couple of pictures will depict that more, but um, as you're standing there where we're looking at her, um, you can see pretty clearly that there's no visible injuries on the front of her body, her legs, her arms, um, maybe some scratches, that sort of thing from the woods, uh, but nothing uh, that would be fatal. Um, however, when you look at her head, there looks like there's uh, a very egregious uh, injury there. And that's what is shown here in Exhibit 125, is that right? Y yes. And then was her head adjusted or picked up and you could see the wound a little bit closer? It was uh, pretty matted with blood, but you could tell that there had been a serious injury to her head. And that's what states Exhibit 126 shows, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. Um, was Noema Graber, after the, that area was processed, where would she have been taken? So uh, she would have been taken because of the nature of uh, the incident to the uh, Iowa Medical Examiner's Office, State Medical Examiner's Office in Ankeny, where an aut uh, autopsy would have been done. Okay. And then the, uh, uh, do you know Dr. Michelle Cavalier? Yes. Uh, would she have performed the autopsy on the Lane McGregor? Yes, she did. Uh, and I know the report is in uh, evidence, the, the, the entirety of the report. But ultimately, what did you learn from Dr. Cavalier that would have assisted you in your investigation? It's, it's, she determined that it was a homicide due to blood force trauma. To her head? To her head, yes. All right. All right, um, Agent Belda, let's go back to uh, John Burnett, if we could. Yes. So whenever you arrived uh, here, uh, John Burnett arrived, was already at the Fairfield Police Department, is that right? He had been there earlier, uh, he went home and then we called him back uh, shortly after I got there. And who did he come to the police department with, if you remember? Uh, his girlfriend, Kaylee, um, I can't remember her last name, John and Kaylee. And can you summarize for the court what information John Burnett was able to provide you and law enforcement that relates to the death of Noe McGraver, as well as Jeremy Goodale and Willard Miller, the defendant. So the, this is when the case, uh, the investigation itself became very fluid. Um, John Burnett had told us that he had information on who had killed Mrs. Graver. Um, part of my job on the oversight assigned people uh, to interviews to different tasks within, within that. So I signed two agents to speak with uh, Burnett and Kaylee. Uh, they provided to us uh, screenshots from Snapchats that he had received from Jeremy Goodale that were very uh, graphic in nature, detailing the murder of uh, Noe McGregor. And did those Snapchats also implicate uh, the defendant, Willard Miller? Yes, they did. Can you summarize that information for the court? Uh, there's a couple important things to note. The, the Snapchats are often deleted as soon as you close, you open them and close them, they become deleted. So there were several initial Snapchats that John Burnett was not able to save. The ones he did save uh, talked about how uh, Jeremy Goodell describes uh, him and another person uh, attacking uh, Mrs. Graver in the uh, park and hitting her with a baseball bat. He also says it was because uh, she gave uh, the wrong student a uh, failing grade in Spanish. Uh, John Burnett would testify that uh, the, some of the other information he had received, including the earlier Snapchats, would implicate Willard Miller in that uh, assault and murder. And just to be clear, the Snapchats that were provided by John Burnett to law enforcement uh, were between John Burnett and Jeremy Goodhill, is that right? That's right. And in those Snapchats, he not only implicated himself, but also the defendant in this case, is that correct? That's correct. 
And is that how the uh, investigation then shifted to focusing on Jeremy Goodale and Willard Miller? It, so what was interesting was when we had first got there, there were uh, the Fairfield Police De Department had uh, listed uh, Willard Miller as a suspect based on some statements he had made to someone else. Uh, Jeremy Goodale was not on the board, but obviously once we had the Snapchats, Goodale uh, and Miller kind of rose to the top of our suspect list. Before I move to the search warrant set, both the Miller and Goodale residences, uh, there was video, I'm not sure we touched on this yet, but there was video of the van of Noe McGraver uh, entering and leaving Chautauqua Park, is that right? That's correct. Um, can you describe that for the judge, please? Uh, it's uh, a ring bell camera. We're kind of in a world now where lots of people have uh, cameras when you ring your doorbell and it starts recording. So it was a house that was facing the entrance to the park, but it recorded the van entering the park around 4 p.m. on November 2nd. And then there was there video of the van leaving the park? Yes, yeah, so the van left the park approximately 4.45 p.m. And can you see in the van who's driving it when it leaves? Not, no, we can't see who was driving when they left the park. Okay, um, Agent Villanus, uh based upon the information that you had, search warrants were then executed at uh, we'll talk first about the Miller residence, is that correct? Yes. And there was also one executed at the Goodale residence? Yes. Uh, we've talked a bit about the bath that was found. Where was that at exactly? Uh, we recovered several baths. I think we recovered two from the Goodale residence and then the one from the Miller residence, which, which would have been in Willard Miller's room. Okay. With regard to the uh, search warrant at the Miller residence, was anything else found um, of any evidentiary value to the investigation that you can recall? Uh, the, his cell phone was seized. Uh, I don't think anything else in the Miller residence was of uh, investigative value. And just to preview this a bit, his cell phone was examined, is that right? Yes. And, and uh, we'll talk a bit about that uh, later. Um, the Goodale residence, what was taken from the Goodale residence that was of value, if you recall? Yeah, there were several pieces of clothing um, that still had blood on them. The clothing was actually, uh, we were able to make made up that clothing with pictures from the Snapchats that Goodale had sent to John Burnett. These are Snapchats with photos that were recovered? That's correct, yes. So other than the searches at the Miller residence, the Goodale residence, was that the only time you searched those two residences? Yes. Okay, and then you also searched the Chautauqua Park in that area, is that right? That's correct. Uh, the van would have been searched, is that correct? Yes. As well as the area around it on the Old Glasgow Road? Yes. All right, any other areas uh, that would have been part of this investigation that you would have searched where anything of significance was found? I, I know the police department had received information where maybe the gloves that were used in the uh, murder were located um, in a storm drain. They weren't able to lo locate those, but as information came in, the police department was very on top of conducting those searches. Although we're gonna cover this later uh, with another witness in this hearing, uh, Willard Miller was interviewed, is that correct? He was. By who? Uh, Special Agent Ryan Kepley. Okay. And, um, was good in all interview. He, uh, we attempted to interview him, but he invoked uh, his rights and re refused to talk to us. And uh, Jeremy Goodell was later interviewed through a uh, proffer agreement, is that right? That's right. Okay. And that was also done by Agent Kedley? Yes. All right. Um, Agent uh, Valletta, there were other uh, young people, high school kids, uh, that you interviewed, or you or other officers interviewed as part of this investigation? Yes. Uh, was one of those uh, young men by the name of Dill Herlin? Yes. Uh, what did Dill Herlin provide to law enforcement uh, that was of assistance in determining who was responsible for the death of Noe McGregor? So, uh, 
Dill Herlin was uh, very, uh, he was at the top of the board, the whiteboard, as far as people we needed to talk to um, in the uh, police department. He had told another uh, team who was, I guess, a relative of one of the jailers. So it kind of came secondhand that uh, Willard Miller had told him that if uh, Noema Graber comes up missing in the next couple weeks not to contact the police. Um, I had signed uh, Special Agent Chris Spencer then to interview Dill Herlin at the police department where he provided additionally um, where that, that statement was in fact true and Dill Herlin also described the conversation he had with Willard Miller in which Will Willard Miller stated that uh, Noema Graber's routes were very predictable and that he could easily hit her with a bat at the park. And do you know what Dale Herlin's relationship was to the defendant Willard Miller? Again, he would be in that friend group. Um, it's kind of hard to determine because they kind of call each other best friends. So. Um, all of them do. Um, I would say be a close friend to both Miller and Goodale. Okay. Did you and others interview other uh, friends or acquaintances of the defendant? Yes, we did. Uh, was one of those Talon system a phone? Yes. I think I just mispronounced his name, but uh, nonetheless, we, you talked to Talon, yes, is that right? Uh, can you describe for the court what information Talon provided you with regard to the death of Noah McGraver? So on November 3rd, at an English class, uh, he had had a conversation with Willard Miller in which Willard Miller uh, told him he had caught someone with a baseball bat. Um, I'm relatively old at this point, I wasn't aware of that term, but uh, Talon interpreted that term and I guess all the teenagers interpreted that term as catching someone with a baseball bat means killing them with a baseball bat. Or at least striking them, correct? Yes. Was Talon able to provide any other uh, statements uh, that he had heard from Willard Miller? I'm not suggesting that he did, I'm just making sure we got it all covered. So, um, who is uh, Zoe Fentel? So she would have been the girlfriend of Jeremy Goodell at the time of, of the murder. And, uh, was she able to provide some information, particularly with regard to location, on November 2nd of both Jeremy Goodell as well as Willard Miller? Yeah, so she, she was a very interesting interview because she had actually met with Jeremy Goodale on November 2nd at Chautauqua Park around 4 p.m. So that would have been around the time that Noah McGraver was entering the park. Uh, she tells us that she observes uh, Willard Miller walking down the path towards where the assault occurred. And Jeremy Goodale actually uh, tells her she needs to leave the park. And uh, so her last I guess a view of Jeremy Goodale is Jeremy Goodale running down towards Willard Miller towards the area where the assault would have taken place. So Zoe Fentel puts both Jeremy Goodale and Willard Miller in Chautauqua Park on November 2nd of 2021, is that correct? Yes, together at the location where the uh, murder had happened. Did she give you any reference as to what time this would have been today? She said it was right around 4 p.m. on November 2nd. Would that have been consistent with other evidence that you uh, viewed in this case? Yes. Uh, particularly as it relates to the van that was driven by Ms. Raver. Yes, yeah, so again on the ring bell camera, the van would have entered the park right around at that time when uh, Zoe Fentel is having that conversation with uh, uh, Jeremy Goodale. Um, Agent Billita, I want to shift a bit here. Uh, in any case, do you attempt to uh, develop uh, the motive for any particular action or death uh, of a victim? So, th that's a great question. The, uh, in, 
in a homicide or a murder, uh, motive isn't one of the elements. However, it seems if we can prove motive, it's what the jury, one of the things the jury wants to hear. So we were actually able to uh, show not only the motive, but also uh, the opportunity that uh, Willard Miller would have had to kill Mrs. Graver. Let's talk a bit about the motive. What information did you develop in this case that would have provided the reason for why Willard Miller would have wanted to kill Noah Graver? So it starts with uh, the Snapchats from Jeremy Goodell in which he says that uh, Noah Graver had failed the wrong student. Uh, we had known uh, due to the investigation from the Fairfield Police Department that uh, earlier on the second uh, Willard Miller and his mom had met with no Noema Graber regarding his failing grade. Um, we had retrieved some uh, school records, emails that would uh, show how Willard Miller was anguishing over how bad his grade was and how he didn't feel that Noema Graber was a good teacher. And then uh, eventually we do a search warrant on. Uh, or celebrate, I, I guess, on uh, Willard Miller's phone, which greatly details the, the motive. Uh, before we talk about that search of the, the Cellarite search, were you able to confirm with the Fairfield Public Schools uh, that he had a, that Willard Miller had a failing grade in Spanish? Yes, he was getting an F at the time of Miller's graders. Yeah. And you were able to confirm that he was actually a student with Noah McGraver, is that right? That is correct. Uh, was Jeremy Goodale a current student of Noah McGraver's in November of 2021? I don't think he was, and I think he actually did pretty well in that class. Okay. He had had her prior as a Spanish teacher, is that right? I believe that's correct, yes. Um, concerning uh, planning, that went into uh, the death of Noah McGraver. Can you just briefly summarize what planning went into uh, the, uh, the, the her death? So it, it appears, uh, according to Jeremy Goodale, that the planning began roughly 10 days to two weeks uh, before her death when uh, Willard Miller uh, started asking people to, to help him uh, with the murder. Um, so that, the planning between uh, Goodale and Miller started around then. Uh, later on, we, are, we were able to recover, uh, it's basically we call it a prep email, where uh, Willard Miller lists several of the items that he would need uh, to commit the, the murder. So about how far in advance of November 2nd did the planning start by the defendant uh, with regard to knowing McGraver's death. Yeah, so according to Dill Herlin, it was about a week and a half, according to Jeremy Goodale, maybe two weeks. So, uh, like I said, I would have to guess between 10 days and two weeks before the murder um, planning had started. Did either Goodale or Miller engage in any surveillance of knowing McGraver prior to her death? Yes, they did. Uh, again, to refer back to uh, Miller's statement to Dill Herlin was they were actually watching her to determine what her routes were. I think uh, pretty early in their surveillance they were able to determine that almost every day or if not every day after school uh, she would go to Chautauqua Park to walk. Had they actually observed her engage in that walk prior to her death? Uh, we can do almost a best guess. We can see that I think it was the day before they were staged to uh, follow her out there, but she actually had a church event that day, so she didn't go. But if I recall correctly, we had video showing them kind of preparing to follow her out to the party. So there was evidence of planning, uh, would that be true? Yes for a substantial period of time, is that the best way to characterize it? Yes. I 
need to shift gears on the screen here. Judge, I'm almost done. I, I think I can describe this, maybe without putting it on the screen, but... We can also put it up on the Oscar. Let's put um, exhibit 130, which is the Google search. I'm sure you can read that, right? Much better. Okay, so this is exhibit 130 that's on the uh, screen. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, how is it that this document would have been created, if you know? It's um, searches that are done on your phone. Uh, they're often just, they stay there forever. Um, so when a celebrite is done or a search warrant is done on to recover those records often the searches are it's just something that people don't think to erase okay so there are a number of entries on this document uh, that relate to a google search uh, created by the defendant is that right that's correct to be clear this information came directly from his phone that you seized is that right yeah yes that's correct on the far right side of this document uh, there are numerous entries that say Chaden's iPhone. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so this is Chaden's iPhone. Yes. All right. If we could move to three, scoot it down a bit to 342. All right. So this is an entry that would have been a Google search. Can you describe at the left hand box that we see in this exhibit what it is we're looking at there? Um, so this is essentially is would be the motive for Noy McGregor's death where uh, Willard Miller is asking if do students receive credit for class if the professor is seriously injured or dies more than halfway through the course. There is a word here that says Cora, is that correct? Can yes. You, can you tell us what that is? Yes, um, it's uh, something you, it's a search engine where you can ask the question and then uh, anonymous people will reply with an answer. There are numerous entries that are very similar in nature that relate to what we've just looked at here in 342, is that right? Yes. Okay, also on this um, cell phone there is a uh, date, is that right? 
Yeah. Uh, yes. The third box, the fourth box over, is that correct? Yes. What does that represent, you know? Uh, that would be October 24th of uh, 2021, which would be roughly uh, two weeks before the murder. Okay, and then um, lastly, we're gonna move to exhibit 131. What are we looking at here in Exhibit 131? So this would be uh, an email. It shows that it uh, kind of when it was created, when it was modified. So it had been modified on uh, October 30th of 21. Uh, we call it the prep email. This is uh, something that was created by Willard Miller um, listing different items and that sort of thing that would be used eventually on the uh, attack on Noah McGraver. This was actually on the left hand, hand side, this would have been created in September of 20, is that right? Uh, yes, that's, that's what the, uh, that's what it shows. Right, and then modified on October 30th of 21, correct? Yes. Which would have been several days before Noah McGraver was murdered, is that right? Yes. Right, and this was created on a, uh, a notes app on the phone, is that correct? Yes. You had sent an email earlier. Do you have evidence that this was actually emailed to anyone, or, or do you know? I, that's just kind of how I read it, just because of the title and the summary. I'm actually quite uh, uh, not very good at describing sometimes the difference. So yes, it, it is a note app. Now there are several items on here, uh, garden gloves, plastic gloves, trash bag, Ziploc bag, wet wipes, and a backpack, is that right? Yes. Would those items have been consistent with what was described in Jeremy Goodell's interview with regard to preparation prior to knowing the Graver's murder? Yes. And were wet wipes found at the scene? Yes, there were several wet wipes at the scene. And then there's a procedure that is also in this uh, message, is that right? Yes. And it says, stun, move off trail, empty compartments, load cargo, blanket cargo, deactivate compartment contents, leave bag by exit, transport, empty tra transport, empty transport, safety stun, switch glove, deactivate article to bag, finalize the win, in parentheses it says secure victory, load into storage spot, don't forget to close the door to the ground, switch glove, move the sticks, wipe down tools, dispose article, and grab bag by exit, and then done. Did I read that correctly? Yes. It's a rather cryptic message, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I would say it's very cryptic and you don't really have to read between the lines to know what he's describing. This would be at least partially consistent with the items that were found at the scene as well as the circumstances that you learned concerning knowing of Raver's death, is that right? That's correct. Um, at this time, uh, I, I don't uh, have any uh, further evidence for, or further questions for Agent Milita. Defendant's cross-examination. Your Honor, before I get started, um, I believe that we will have an exhibit. What number would you like to use for that exhibit? The um, last number or actually you guys used the letters was C C C C. So if you wanted to use quadruple D. Um, Your Honor, I can either do that or this was previously admitted as a suppression exhibit M. Okay, suppression exhibit M is um, in the file. Yeah, go ahead. We can just May approach the go ahead. Agent Valletta, I'm handing you an item that was 
previously marked as suppression exhibit N. Are those the recovered Snapchat messages between Jeremy Goodell and John Burnett? Yes. And the recovered messages, just to clarify, um, Jeremy Goodell says that it was uh, he alone uh, involved in um, swinging the bat and involved in the physical acts relating to the murder, correct? In the ones that you just handed me, that's what he said, but you also need to keep in mind there were other messages that he had sent to John Burnett that John Burnett was not able to screenshot. And, and I'm clarifying because I think that there is, um, earlier in your testimony, you said that the recovered messages were the ones that implicated Ms. Mr. Miller, in fact. These are the recovered messages, correct? Yes. And in this case, um, very specifically, uh, Jeremy Goodell says, I walked up behind her uh, and caved in her skull with a bat, correct? Yes. And uh, each of the statements within the recovered messages, at least, are Jeremy Goodell's statements that he was the one who swung the bat, correct? What you just read to me is exactly how it's worded. So. And, uh, Your Honor, I offer, I ask that the state, Your Honor, I ask that the court take, recognize a suppression exhibit M as one of the exhibits for sentencing. And I will, and I uh, will just take judicial notice of the entire court file. If there's no objection from the state. No, Your Honor. Go ahead. Your Honor, can we step back to that? Um, I'm, the defense may have some objection to taking judicial notice of the entire court file. Could we maybe address that after break? We can. Um, I'll take judicial notice of uh, case M, or uh, exhibit M for the suppression here. Thank you, Your Honor. So, there is uh, quite a bit of physical evidence collected, correct? Yes. And um, with regard to blood and DNA evidence, there was evidence found on the clothing of Jeremy Goodell that the blood of Noe McGregor, correct? Yes. There is no blood found on any item of clothing or anything related to Willard Miller, correct? That's correct. You referenced Jeremy Goodale's statements. Jeremy Goodale's statements were made in February 23rd of 2023. Yes. And then he made no statements prior to that. No. So any statements he made would have been after he had access to the DCI file, depositions, minutes of testimony? Um, yes, that would be correct. And those statements were made at a point in time when he was trying to obtain a deal with the state and as part of obtaining a deal with the state. Yes. Then go back. You were at Willard Miller's home and, and part of those interviews. Yes. Willard Miller had just had a meeting with Noema Draper right the day of her death? Yes, I think it was a couple hours prior. And he and his mother both said that, that meeting went well? I don't recall exactly. Um, I remember, I think I saw an email regarding that, but I don't exactly recall what was said during that meeting. Uh, within his home, well, within the interview, you found out that he now had a Spanish tutor? I did not know that. No. You didn't see that he had completed Spanish homework in his home? From what I saw from the school records, it looked like he had a lot of incomplete homework. Right. Within his home, did you find, when you were doing the search, find completed homework on his desk? I. I wasn't part of that search. I don't remember seeing that one through his evidence. Now, 
Jeremy Goodale made statements about items that were discarded in a storm sewer, correct? Yes. None of those were recovered. That's correct. And let me step to the list that was um, provided to you from Mr. Miller's phone. Uh, there are a number of items on that list that were not at the scene, like hedge clippers, correct? Yes. And in fact, that list initially was created at a time before Mr. Miller had ever met Ms. Graber. It, okay, so that's how I would interpret it, although someone tried to explain to me that that could have been uh, uh, the 920, uh, 20, 2020 date could have been a different list, and then this one was just modified, so it was literally the original list was erased and this one was created. But I have no way of knowing if that's true or not. So the initial document, whatever it said, was created prior to even being in the scripture's class? Whatever that original document said. But again, um, I understand what you're, what you're saying, that it looks like the prep list was created on 920, but I was also, the tech people were trying to explain to me that just because it was created then doesn't mean that content was created then. And then you talked about some, a statement made to Dill Verlin uh, about if Mrs. Graber goes missing. Mr. Verlin thought that was a, a joke, correct? Uh, I think a lot of the students that uh, received uh, troubling statements from both Miller and Goodell didn't feel that it was, uh, like maybe they were hoping that that wasn't true, but uh, it, this isn't like a normal type of conversation either. Well, let's talk about before November 2nd. Okay. 2021. Any of those statements were perceived as a joke to anyone who Mr. Miller spoke with, correct? Um, yes, I mean, I don't know if they took it seriously. However, uh, Bill Herlin must have had some concern because, like I said, the Fairfield Police Department didn't know about it, um, at least before I got there. But again, that was prior to the disappearance of Ms. Graber. Bill Berlin expressed that he thought it was a joke. I mean, he said, I thought he was joking, correct? Correct, yes. Chad Miller had turned in some homework during the meeting with the 
it's greater. That, that could be true. Um, the, again, just based off the current uh, caseload, I guess, for Mrs. Graber, um, it showed that he had a lot of incomplete assignments, but um, obviously she wasn't able to update that. Well, he had to, you had learned that he had turned in some homework. Um, are you referring to that meeting before on yes. the same day on November 2nd? Yes. I believe that's true. And he had photos on his phone of Spanish homework. I believe that's true. Too. And the photos of the Spanish homework were after the search about what happens if your Spanish teacher disappears, correct? Yes. physical evidence recovered at the scene that would be consistent with Jaden Miller's prep list uh, also. So uh, physical evidence would also uh, correspond with uh, the pre-planning done by Miller as well as then uh, some of the statements of good ailment. So I just, I'm going to clarify, you said that physical evidence would be consistent with prep list. The physical evidence is also consistent with Miller's statement that Jeremy Goodall was the one who had the bat. Correct? I don't think Goodell would dispute at one point he held on to the bat. So um, I would say that physical evidence, as far as showing fingerprints or D, uh, Goodell's DNA, um, no. However, Goodell has openly admitted that so, am I answering your question? The only question I'm asking is there's no physical evidence 
that it's in dispute with what Mr. Miller said. As far as him swinging the bat? That Mr. Miller said that Mr. Goodale was the one who struck, who swung the bat. The physical evidence oh, doesn't disagree with that. I see what you're saying, yes. There's no physical evidence to dispute that. I have no further questions. Uh, Mr. Brown, any other questions? Just one thing that relates to uh, the statements. The only evidence we have is what people tell us with regard to who swung the bat and how many times, correct? That's correct. We have physical evidence that would suggest that Noe McGraver had blunt force injuries consistent with getting struck by a baseball bat. Yes. As far as who swung it, we have to rely on what Jeremy Goodell says and what Willard Miller may tell us, correct? That's correct. There are no other eyewitnesses, right? There's no eyewitnesses. However, Willard Miller did tell Talon that he swung a bat to uh, I was getting to that. Okay. So, <laughs> but Willard Miller makes admissions that you've already identified, one of which would have been to Talon, another to possibly Bill Herlin, that he was directly involved in striking Noe McGraver with the bat. Is that right? That's correct. Anything else before I said? Jerry Goodall made statements to many people that he was the one who swung the bat, correct? The only statements that I'm aware of that Goodell would have made would have been the night of the murder, and that would be through Snapchats and maybe uh, I think a phone call to one other uh, kid. So I don't know if saying that he told a lot of people, I would almost say probably Jamie Miller probably told more people than Goodell. Well, Mr. Goodell was on uh, PlayStation and talked with more than one person on PlayStation. Right? Yes, he did. And he sent out Snapchats to more than one person, but we know that at least John Burnett is the one who captured that, correct? Yes. And Mr. Goodell also went to a party where he referenced the blood on his shoes, correct? Uh, maybe. I'm not. I, that seems familiar, but I can't say for sure if I remember that. I have no further questions. Nothing else. Oh. Uh, Agent Valetti can step down. We'll take a 10 minute recess and reconvene at 11 o'clock. Just real quick, um, since where we're at on time, uh, Mike Heinersey from Oakdale is here. We'll probably just call him next since he came. Uh, I told him 11 o'clock, so I think he's got to get back. If that's okay with the court, fine with me. On recess.
And is it staffed full time by counselors and other employees of the Department of Corrections? Yes, it is. Uh, and is there a special program uh, that is uh, utilized for um, young men who are put into that program? Yes. Can you just generally describe what the programming is in the uh, youthful offender program? Yeah, so um, typically um, the size of the program is obviously, you know, is dictated by the courts, but we usually have somewhere around 10, maybe 15 on the unit at any given time. And each of those that are admitted has the opportunity, actually, let me rephrase that, it's a requirement if they don't have their education done for them to go to, to schooling uh, 16 hours a week. And once they have completed that, um, they can focus on some other things, but a lot of times um, that's their full-time job is getting their schooling done. Um, we also have some uh, some programming that we offer. Uh, it's called Moral Recognition Thera Therapy. It's a cognitive-based program. Um, we teach them some life skills. Um, they all have a significant amount of one-on-one -on -one time because with their counselor and psychologist because of, it's a small smaller unit, and so there's opportunities to to meet with them on a more regular basis than there would be uh, in a traditional general population setting. You had mentioned earlier that it's sight and sound separated, is that right? That is correct. What does that mean? That means that uh, no, uh, no adult uh, prisoner inmate uh, can be on the unit unless there's uh, a staff member directly with them at all times. So nobody else lives on the unit other than the youthful offenders, and the only time other offenders are on the unit is if it's absolutely necessary. And is it located on the same uh, campus as Oakdale, the, the men's prison? Yes. Is it a newer facility? No. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Heinrichsee, the uh, in this case, Willard Miller is almost 18. Um, assuming he's sentenced to the prison sentence, he would go to Oakdale, is that right? That is correct. Uh, even though he has about uh, 30 plus days uh, prior to his birthday, maybe a little bit less even, um, would he still be placed in the youthful offender unit? Yes, he would. And would he be able to take advantage of whatever programming can be implemented in that short amount of time? Yes, he would. Um, even though it's a short amount of time, would your staff make an effort to uh, engage in the programming that you just mentioned? Yes, they would. Um, is there any possibility that even though he might move to the adult side of Oakdale once he turns 18, uh, that that programming would follow him? Yes, it would. Okay. Now, I want to talk a bit about uh, younger offenders that are adults. Um, is there a programming that is different for, say, an 18-year-old that is going into the Department of Corrections as opposed to somebody who may be a habitual offender or is older? You know, our programming is, is based on the assessments that are done, uh, and those assessments will be done uh, once the individual comes to our facility, but the, the programming is, is not any different. Um, we teach the same um, for the most part, with the exception of the life skills piece. Um, the MRT, the Moral Recognition Therapy, is a huge piece of our department, so it's taught uh, in different folds across the state. So regardless of whether he was in the youthful offender unit or uh, at another facility or in our general population, he would have those opportunities. And once uh, Willard Miller would move to the adult side of the prison, do you have any idea what his programming might entail? I, I do not, not without the, the staff doing um, the assessments that they do and, and you know, gathering all of that uh, will dictate what a lot of that looks like. And it would be individualized to him, is that correct? Yes. Uh, is that the same for any inmate that comes into Oakdale? Yes. Okay. Um, once Willard Miller would transfer to the adult side of the prison, uh, is there any guarantee that he stays at Oakdale for the near future? No. Okay. Where, where might he go, uh, be assigned to other facilities? Do you have any idea what that might be? I mean, once he, uh, there, his counselor uh, uh, is with him when he's on the youthful offender unit, uh, if he would be on the youthful offender unit, we'll have those discussions with our placement office. Um, but 
hypothetically, um, if he doesn't stay with us, um, there's a high probability that he would go to ISP, Iowa State Penitentiary. At Fort Madison? Correct. Is that because of the nature of the offense that right. uh, he pled to? Correct. Okay. Um, you and I had a conversation prior to court um, in the previous week or so where we discussed a mandatory minimum sentences. Do you recall that? Yes. Uh, I had asked you a question regarding whether or not programming is different for someone who receives a mandatory minimum as opposed to someone who does not. Do you recall that? Yes. Uh, can you provide that um, context to the court as to how programming is implemented uh, given those two factors? Yes. Um, so, you know, the, the need uh, outweighs what we have the ability to do. And what I mean by that is if, if somebody has a mandatory for, you know, 25 years, whatever the case may be, uh, that person's not going to get into programming most likely anytime soon. It will be closer to the end of their mandatory because we have to focus our resources on um, those that are releasable in a, in a quicker fashion. So those that have a longer sentence with a mandatory um, don't necessarily get into programming sooner with the exception of education. Okay. So if uh, Willard Miller comes to you and is a youthful offender and goes into the first unit that you described, uh, because he would be getting out of that so quickly, would he become a priority as far as programming? Or do you know? Not necessarily, probably not. I don't know that for sure. Um, but if you're talking, you know, six weeks, it's going to be difficult, but they would, they would at least uh, look at the possibility of starting it, yeah. Okay. And then whenever he uh, shifts to the adult side of Oakdale, uh, let's say he gets a 30-year minimum sentence, whenever you say that he will receive education, at least initially, what do you mean by that? Well, by law, um, anybody that's under 21 uh, is eligible to go to school, so if they haven't completed their education. So education is a little bit separate from the other programming piece that I, that I talked about because of the age he would be eligible to, to finish his uh, high set. His what? High set, that's what, GED. Okay. But we go by high set now, H-I-S-E-T. Okay. And if he's already received a, a equivalent uh, a high school diploma, would he be able to uh, engage in education or classes that would be uh, post-secondary? Yes. Okay. So if you're at Oakdale and you're a prisoner, you can attend college level courses, is that right? That is correct. Or at least get that type of education. That is correct. Is it possible for an inmate uh, like Willard Miller uh, to gain a college degree if he's in prison? Yes. And how, how does that happen? And what, how does that work? Uh, can you describe that for us? So each prison is a little bit different, you know, because it's regional and our, our partnerships are based on community colleges on, on where, we're, where we're located. So our, our agreement is with Kirkwood. Um, you got a place like Fort Dodge that has an agreement with Iowa Central Community College. Um, anything that's beyond uh, the basic level of education uh, has to be paid for by someone other than, than us. So whether the, the inmate has the funds or his family has the funds, and then we can work with the community colleges and then um, there's also some online opportunities that people can do um, to go even farther. I've seen people get bachelor's degrees um, during my time in the Department of Corrections. So it, it's kind of de depends on where you're at, but the opportunity is there um, if you have the funding and you're able to do so. All right. And once uh, the defendant turns 18, other than education, is he able to be uh, employed while he is an inmate at Oakdale or any other facility? Yes. Can you describe that for us, please? Yeah, I mean, we employ uh, a variety of, of different people because we need those um, labor type jobs to be able to run the facility. So it's going to depend on, on where he's at. But, you know, we're talking laundry, maintenance, dietary, all these different things that you would need inside of a, of a school, of a, of, a, of a prison, of a community. Um, we have people that assist with. Um, ADLA work uh, with uh, hospice stuff. Um, there's vocational programs um, that are available depending on, on what the facility you end up with. You can get a, a trade, you can get um, uh, apprenticeship certified 
um, and each facility that we have in the department has certain ones that are um, geared towards what they have at their facility. So even though there, if there were a substantial minimum that the defendant would have to serve, he could go to school, receive an education, and be employed while he's a prisoner. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. All right. Thank you. That's all I have. From the defendant. Any program other than uh, having a job or education would likely wait until closer to the end of any mandatory minimum. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, on the other hand, if there was no mandatory minimum, programs would start immediately. Not necessarily. It would start sooner? <coughs> it depends on, if you're speaking of, of, of this sentence, I don't know what you mean by that. So it's going to, the assessments that are done are going to dictate a, a rough figure of what it would be appropriate for somebody to get into programming. The mandatory minimum piece would, 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 it's more concrete, it's more black and white. But even without the mandatory minimum, aside from education, uh, there would not be an opportunity for programming outside of the people of the unit, most likely. Now, I can't speak for where he would end up, but I'm just basing it on everything that I've known for the last 21 years of working for the department. But a mandatory minimum tends to delay programming until you get towards the end of that mandatory minimum. That is correct. And you haven't reviewed anything specific to this case and to Willard Mill, correct? No. And um, you're only testifying about programming. You're not test you're not a psychologist, correct? No, I'm not. No further questions. Anything else for this witness? Uh, nothing else. Thank you. State may call the next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls speculation of Ryan Headley. You promise to affirm and tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please have a seat. Good morning, Agent Kelly. Good morning. Um, before we get started, you were in the room here when um, Special Agent Valletta was speaking uh, previously, correct? I was, yes. Okay, so I might brush through some of the things that Special Agent Valletta had already spoken about, and if I'm missing something, please give me a holler, would you? Sure. Um, for the record, could you state and spell your name for the benefit of the court reporter? Yes, my first name is Ryan, R-Y-A-N, last name Kedley, K-E-D-L-E-Y. And Agent Kedley, uh, what is your uh, profession? Uh, I am currently employed as a special agent within the Iowa Department of Public Safety's Division of Criminal Investigation. And you have a specified assignment or unit within the Division of uh, Criminal Investigation? I do, yes. And what is that? Uh, I work within the DCI's major crime unit, uh, which specializes in high-level violent crimes throughout the state of Iowa. Uh, this position I've occupied since 2014. And do you have a regional assignment? I do, yes. And what is that? Uh, so my specific office is located just outside the Quad Cities, but my general area of responsibility within which I work is East and Southeast Iowa. Um, and you heard Special Agent Valletta talk about the, uh, the details of the investigation into the death of Mrs. Graber, correct? I did, yes. Could you walk us through um, what was going on in, in your professional world um, on the day of, uh, of that assignment when you were uh, down here in Fairfield? Yes, so approximately around the same time that Agent uh, Villado was contacted and directed by our immediate supervisor to respond to Fairfield uh, with regard to this uh, missing person death investigation, uh, I was also called to respond and provide any sort of investigative assistance necessary. 
Uh, once I arrived there at the Fairfield Police Department and the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, uh, I met with Agent Valletta, um, also with uh, Agent Richard Vale, V-A-L-E, also of the DCI, as well as local investigators to get a, um, at least a initial briefing on the status of the investigation up to that point. Uh, when you arrived on scene, had the investigation pro proceeded and progressed to a certain extent? Yes. Um, what kind of a scene were you walking into? And so at this point, by the time that uh, agents of the DCI had arrived there in Jefferson County, uh, we had been advised of Miss Graber's status of having gone missing and then being located deceased at Chautauqua Park. Uh, and so um, as part of that, being advised of that information, uh, under the direction of Case Agent Villada, uh, Case Agent Villada begins delegating certain responsibilities to assisting, assisting agents and officers within law enforcement. Um, those responsibilities can be anywhere from crime scene management to neighborhood canvas interviews to person of interest interviews. And is it fair to state that uh, upon your arrival and engagement with this case, it, it has become a homicide investigation? It certainly appeared to be, yes. And what was your specific assignment or delegation? And so initially, uh, as we were going through the briefing, we were advised um, specifically of the information that uh, John Burnett uh, had begun providing information indicating that he was aware of the person or persons responsible for the death of Melvina Graber. And so case agent Villa had requested that I meet directly with uh, Mr. Burnett and Katie McGuire. Uh, I believe it was his girlfriend there at the Fairfield Police Department to further discuss the information which they both held. And the information that they both held, um, what, where did that lead you in your investigation? Uh, that information um, detailed through the course of several screenshots of Snapchat communications uh, led us to identifying Jeremy Goodale uh, and Shady Miller uh, as being certain persons of interest and suspects in the death of Melvin Graver. Based on this information and your interview uh, with those two individuals, um, what investigative steps were taken? And so um, after the initial interview of, of Mr. Burnett and Ms. McGuire, uh, search warrants were uh, offered for the um, search of the persons of both uh, Mr. Goodale and Mr. Miller, as well as their respective residences. Um, and was, were you delegated to uh, engage in the uh, execution of either or both of those search warrants? I was, yes. Did anything happen in between the, or the signing of the warrants and the execution of the warrant? Yes. What was happening, uh, what else was happening in Jefferson County at that time? I believe in the very, very rural southwest uh, Jefferson County, a suicidal subject was um, located uh, and a standoff had begun that had stemmed from a domestic disturbance. And so because all of the law enforcement resources in the county of Jefferson had responded to that location where the standoff was in progress, uh, agents of the DCI also responded to assist uh, delaying the execution of the aforementioned warrants. So in the middle of this homicide investigation, there was a completely separate investigation that you also uh, were a part of? Yes, that's correct. Um, about what time did you, uh, were you able to execute the warrants that were signed? Uh, it was very early morning, um, around the time of 5 o'clock. It would be best documented through my, my own narrative, which is detailed in the case report, but very early morning on November 4th, um, I specifically was delegating the responsibility of accompanying other local officers to the residence of Jeremy Goodale uh, to hopefully locate Jeremy, uh, execute a warrant for his uh, residence as well as his person, uh, looking for, among other things, uh, evidence associated with the potential crime as well as uh, cellular phone device. And I presume that other officers uh, executed a similar warrant for the residence of the defendant? Yes, that's correct. At some point, you became familiar with Mr. Miller, correct? I did, yes. Um, when in the, in the course of this day did that take place? 
Well, certainly during the course of the interview of Mr. Burnett, uh, when I had discussed with Mr. Burnett and Katie McGuire uh, the details um, of those Snapchat communications, uh, they had also indicated that there was other communications um, specifically identifying Mr. Miller as um, working with Goodale on the execution of the murder of Graver. And um, after, well, take a step back to the, uh, the execution of the warrant, um, were there uh, individuals taken into custody via these warrants? Uh, essentially, yes. And who was taken into custody? Uh, both uh, Jeremy Goodale and William Chaney Noble Miller. And after Mr. Miller was taken down to the uh, Jefferson County Police Department, you had an opportunity to speak with him? I did, yes. Um, and he signed a, uh, a juvenile waiver of his Miranda rights, correct? He did, yes. Um, are you aware of whether or not Mr. Goodale uh, had conversations with law enforcement of any substantive nature on that day? Uh, none of any substantive, substantive uh, nature. I myself had had um, uh, addressed Mr. Goodale at his residence, and then again at the police department. Um, I assisted in the securing of his cell phone, and then in the acquisition of any items of evidentiary value taken off of his person. But in terms of any further interview, that did not take place uh, on that particular morning. You generated non-testimonial evidence, but no testimony from Mr. Goodale. That's correct, yes. And we'll, we'll get to this down the road, but um, later on in this case, you were able to sit down in person with Mr. Goodale and have a conversation with him, is that right? I was, yes. Okay. Uh, going back to your interview with Mr. Miller, um, this interview was audio and video recorded, was it not? It was, yes. Um, and in a couple of minutes, I'd like to play some excerpts of that interview. Um, but could you just kind of give us a, a, a rough thumbnail sketch of, of your conversation with Mr. Miller, how it started, and some really kind of relevant uh, points of that conversation with Mr. Miller starting at the beginning? Yes, yeah, so um, again, setting the stage, uh, Mr. Miller was woken up from his home and brought to the local police department for the sake of uh, being interviewed as part of an ongoing homicide investigation. And so he was also subjected to a search warrant. And so upon meeting in person with, with Mr. Miller and, and identifying, introducing myself and Special Agent Vail, who assisted on this interview, um, we had initially advised him of his um, juvenile waiver, Miranda rights. Um, he had elected to sign that, um, that form and then permitted us to continue questioning him. Uh, for the better part of the first section, um, several minutes, if not 20 to 30 minutes of the interview, it was basically laying the groundwork of, of um, understanding the fundamental basis of, of who Chayden was, um, what his role within the school was, how he knew Ms. Graber, um, how his life in general was going. Um, I would say that that conversation was very cordial uh, between uh, myself, Agent Vale, and Mr. Miller. Would you be able to classify or kind of describe Mr. Miller's demeanor during the course of this uh, initial conversation? Um, certainly compared to several other uh, interviews which have turned out to be those of suspects, um, I would describe Miller's demeanor as being remarkably relaxed, uh, especially given the circumstances of, of his age, the nature of the interview, uh, the time of the interview, um, the fact that he was so um, comfortable and open, uh, seemingly open with investigators in that opening stage of the, of the um, interview, I felt was very remarkable. Now you, you just qualified your statement, seemingly open. Uh, did that initial uh, conversation that you had with Mr. Miller, let's call it conversation one, uh, did the facts that were unearthed or, or, or uh, attested to by Mr. Miller change as the conversation progressed? Yes, they did. Um, at what point did you kind of note that maybe there was more to this story and maybe Mr. Miller was um, holding back or changing some of the relevant facts in this case? Uh, well, early on in the, in the interview with Mr. Miller, um, while trying to get to know Mr. Miller as best I could, one of the questions that I had asked him was, who were some of his close friends? 
And I felt that it was notable in his response where he listed several friends, but one of them was not Mr. Goodale himself. Um, not that I know him well enough to say that that was definitively untrue, but I did think that it was notable to circle back around later on in the interview to, to confirm that. Uh, at this point of the interview, uh, you had two suspects, principal suspects in mind, correct? That's correct. And it, did you have kind of some foreknowledge that they were close? Yes. Mr. Goodale and Mr. Miller? Yes. So it would stand out that Mr. Miller would indicate Mr. Goodale was a close associate? Yes, it would. Um, and during the course of his uh, essentially running through his day on the day of Mrs. Graber's death, um, did he uh, indicate to you initially that he had spent any time with Mr. Goodale? No, he did not. Uh, did that later uh, come out that it was uh, actually a substantial portion of his day was with Mr. Goodale? Yes, it did. Um, what are some other factors that might be might have kind of tickled your your um, concern about Mr. Miller's story? Uh, well, in, in detailing um, his life events throughout the course of that day on the afternoon and evening of November second, um, he was pretty confident in the way he exhibited that information of. He had gone from having a meeting with his mother and Miss Graver at the school to going to the office of his mother where he continued to do homework while his mother worked and going from there directly to his home where he spent the remainder of the evening. Um, and um, as we reiterated that account, um, he began to change that account. One of the initial items that he changed was the fact that um, who he had run into. Um, upon first saying that he had not come across Jeremy Goodale throughout the course of that afternoon and evening, um, later on he admitted that sure enough he had. And um, to clarify, this was an interview that was taking place approximately a day and a half after the information we were discussing. So I would have presumed, in spite of the fact that it was early morning, that he would have had a pretty good recollection of what exactly happened and who he came across. And so after initially um, denying running into uh, Mr. Goodale on his way from his mother's office to his home, then he came around and said, actually, yes, I did run into him, which um, I found a bit concerning that that one small point would be omitted, again, given the circumstances and the, the timing of the interview. Did you speak with Mr. Miller about the last time he saw Mrs. Graber? I did, yes. And uh, did that story change? Uh, yes, it did. Um, did you speak to him about his physical whereabouts uh, the day of Mrs. Graves' death? Yes. And did that story change? Yes. How many versions of the story would you say that Jaden spun for you during the course of your interview? Well, there were certainly multiple versions, um, but within some of the later versions that he provided, he had, would add details um, as I would uh, break down those versions. Um, for example, um, in addition to what he was doing specifically, how those were, how those um, actions were taken. Um, Mr. Miller originally denied having any knowledge about um, the death of Mrs. Graver, correct? That's correct. Um, and later on, he talked about uh, actually witnessing a part uh, or a portion of, of her demise, correct? Yes, he described a, I guess, an incident where a group of masked individuals numbered somewhere between six and eight uh, had pursued uh, Miss Graber in Chautauqua Park. Uh, Miller described hearing what he described as a thud and then looking down into Chautauqua Park and seeing this group of masked individuals carry some sort of object into the woods, which he had assumed was Miss Graber herself. Now, did Mr. Miller, uh, was he able to provide for you the names of any of these six to eight masked individuals who allegedly uh, drugged Mrs. Graber into the woods? Uh, not specifically the names of those individuals. Uh, no, he was not. Were any names kind of generated by Mr. Miller during the course of this interview? Yes. Um, and without listing all the names per se, um, in your later conversation with Mr. Goodale, 
were any of the names uh, consistent? So during that initial interview with Mr. Miller, um, one of the questions I believe I asked him was, were there people out there that he felt or knew about that may have wanted to do harm to Miss Miss Graber? Um, he had actually identified that yes, there were several people that had gone through Miss Graber's class and had ill feelings towards Miss Graber, and then also um, at least provided, I believe, at least three specific names of classmates of his who he thought were capable and had ill feelings towards Miss Graber. In your later conversation with uh, co-defendant Goodale, did Mr. Goodale tell you any individuals that Mr. Miller maybe had a beef with or had troubles with? Uh, I believe that he said that he didn't have any issues of bullying, but he did have some disagreements with some of his classmates and slash associates at Fairfield High School. And were any of the names that Mr. Goodale listed as people Mr. Miller had problems with at high school the same names as he listed as being involved in the death of Mrs. Graber? I believe that they were, yes. Um, Your Honor, at this point, uh, the state has a 30 minute video that it intends to play, which is an excerpt of the interview with Mr. Miller. Um, let's play it now, or of course, they take up and take a line break. Let's get started with the video. I do, yeah. I'm sorry. If, I do, yes. Is this the room that you conducted an uh, interview with Jason Miller? I believe it is, yes.
somewhat limited to those opening few days and um, case agent Valletta would be the person to specifically discuss whether any other information um, was was reviewed indicative of other parties being responsible me personally I am not aware of any other additional information that came about uh, indicating others were responsible thank you this time probably a decent time to pause the uh, yeah, we can take our lunch break now, and uh, council uh, gave me a, uh, maybe if we start back up at one, is that acceptable? Sure. Your Honor, I would ask if we have another 115. That's fine. Thank you. We'll be tomorrow if we don't set. Keep on, keep the train around the tracks. 
word um, after our lunch break. Mr. Molling, you were uh, asking this uh, agent Kedley if you want to continue. Hey, Your Honor. Afternoon, Agent Kedley. We just finished uh, reviewing your interview with um, the defendant in November of 2020. Um, I'd like to, if, if we don't mind, turn excerpts of 129, which is in the record. Um, Special Agent Kedley had the opportunity to interview Mr. Miller Goodale at some point. I did, yes. Could you walk us through the facts and circumstances of the opportunity to interview Mr. Goodale? So, as I said earlier in my testimony, uh, in this investigation was relative to a few interviews that were conducted in the early stages to include that of uh, William Chapin. Um, after the initial week or so of the investigation away and was obligated to other duties within, within my area of responsibility. Uh, in 2023, um, I was contacted by the prosecution in this particular case and advised Jeremy Goodale um, had agreed in principle to sit for a and given the fact that I had conducted of Mr. Miller um, and knowledge about the, the case at that point, I was able to conduct a proper interview with Mr. Miller to do so um, with Lieutenant the Fairfield Police Department also sitting in we have a freeze frame from a, uh, a video image. I do, yes. And um, in, in addition to you and uh, Officer Kinsella, who are the individuals? Yes, so sitting uh, me um, wearing all orange, Jeremy Goodale, uh, to the left is one member of his council, followed by a number of Okay, and so the video was audio and video recorded. It was, yes. Um, to get into the, the, the conversation taking place. Uh, this interview took inside an interview room at the sheriff's office uh, near where Mr. Goodell. Mr. Goodell, at the time of this video. Uh, That's correct. Yes. Um, I will play.
Sure. 
Um, it would have been the screwdriver, hammer, baseball bat, and a water pocket knife. And then you you would start with the ring and hook it up yourself? No. Okay. And then so the, the plan is to, he's going to get the ring ahead, you're going to stay and watch out, and then you're going to together remove her from the trail. What's the plan after that? There wasn't really a plan beyond that. It was just improvisation. Okay. Like, hide the body, hide the body, stage the body. At that time, we were going to hide the body and have come up that we could try and put it out there as a suicide of some sort of layer on the tracks. So that's just, it didn't seem right. It didn't seem like it worked. So 
that I was involved in the case, yes. Thank you. Sorry, I have questions. Cost damage. Age Kelly, that was a proper as part of a plea deal, is that correct? I believe it preceded any sort of plea deal, but I, I believe that subsequently there was a plea deal in place, yes. And part of the, what you're looking at was whether or not a plea deal could be formed based on Mr. Goodale's agreement to testify against Willard Miller? Well, to be clear, that's not my responsibility in making those types of decisions. Ultimately, those decisions are made by, by the state. Um, my role is to only conduct an interview. But you were aware that you were looking for information that Mr. Goodale could give against Willard Miller? Potentially. Ultimately, we were just looking for, for what his account was and how that account would be used down the road was, was not my role. Certainly you were aware, though, that there is the potential to testify against a co-defendant? Certainly the potential, yes.
afternoon, Lieutenant. There's a button at the bottom of your mic stand. Thank you. Uh, for the benefit of the court reporter, would you mind stating and spelling your name? Julie, J-U-L-I-E, Kinsella, K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A. And how are you presently employed? I'm a police officer for the city of Fairfield. How long have you been with the city of Fairfield? The beginning of October, only 29 years. Pretty uh, familiar with the town of Fairfield after 29 years of patrolling it, I imagine. Yes. Um, I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, you were in the room with um, when Special Agent Valletta was testifying about all the details of, of um, the investigation in this case, correct? Yes. Um, how did Fairfield Police Department become aware that Mrs. Graber was missing? Paul Graber reported his wife missing uh, about 8.30 on November 3rd. Um, shortly after Paul reported his wife missing, we got a call from the school that said that Noe McGraver had not shown up for work. It was very out of character for her. She had never been a no-show, no-call prior to that time. You mentioned Paul Graber. Um, is it fair to state that when a, a significant other goes missing that um, you, know, you, you might look at the, the male party uh, first just to clear them? Yes. Um, was Paul cleared in the missing or, or disappearance or death of Mrs. Graber? Yes. How, how was that pr process undertaken? We did several interviews with Paul Graber. Uh, we subsequently got a search warrant of the Graber residence. And then we started corroborating things with the school, what was told to us by the school. And everything that Paul Graber had told us was accurate that we could prove. At a certain point, the report of Mrs. Graber being missing transitioned into a homicide investigation. How did that transition? Um, I, I want to go back. Once we listed her as a missing person, um, we didn't need release. So then we started getting information in at times that people had seen Mrs. or Noe McGraber prior to us. Um, we decided since the last place that we saw Noe McGraber was at Chautauqua Park. We couldn't locate her vehicle at that point. We couldn't locate her. That we were going to start with the park, do a grid search of the park, and then go from there. Was a grid search of the park conducted? Yes, it was. And what were the results? And Wayne McGregor's body was found where it's been previously stated. I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Can you scoot the mic a little bit? Perfect. You're familiar with the defendant, Chief Miller? I am now, yes. How long did it take between the finding of Mrs. Graber's body uh, and the defendant being taken into custody? Approximately 10 hours. During the course of this case, were you able to develop a, a theory as to the motive as to why Jaden Miller would want Mrs. Graber dead? Yeah, Jaden Miller needed a passing Spanish grade in order to get his study abroad program that he wanted. You wanted to go to Spain? Yes. Hard to go to Spain if you don't pass Spanish. <laughs> In your conversations with other, other people around, were there other students that Mr. Miller expressed his disdain or, or um, anger towards Mrs. Graber to? Yes. Who were they? Uh, Zach Askar was one of the people. What did he tell Mr. Askar? He said that he was angry, didn't like how Miss Graber taught the class, um, and that one day he hoped that she would be dead. Anybody else? Uh, Dill Hurling. What was told Mr. Hurling? Same thing that's been previously stated. If she shows up missing, don't go to the police. Anybody else? And that pattern might be it. That might, yeah, I think that's it that I recall. Um, did the defendant brag or boast after the death, death of Mrs. Graber to any of the students? Town of Sissipane. What did he brag to Mr. Sissipane? I caught a body with a bat.
Were you present in the interview room with Mr. Goodale, along with Speculation Kevley and others, uh, where he disclosed his part in the homicide? Yes. Um, and you heard his disclosure about the order of, of striking Mrs. Graber? Yes. Um, was Mr. Goodale's version of events corroborated by any other evidence that you discovered in this case? Obviously, the Snapchat messages, both to two of his gaming buddies, uh, the Snapchat messages to John Burnett. And, and how specifically did that corroborate? Uh, what he told the gaming buddies was that uh, he, that Chayden, he was involved with Chayden in the murder of Mrs. Graber. Chayden had hit her over the head, she fell over, and that basically he finished her off. And that gaming buddy is Mr. Austin dude? Mr. Austin dude. Uh, and that's a, a Snapchat handle? Yes, his real name is Jack Roll. to um, the prep list or the notes uh, items. Um, did you, were you aware or did you see the, uh, the notes app uh, evidence that was presented earlier? Yes. Um, in your investigation of this case, were wet wipes found at the scene? Yes. And were wet wipes on that, on that note? Yes. Uh, Ziploc bag? Pardon me? A Ziploc bag, was that involved? Yes. Backpack? Yes. Hammer? Yes. Did you review the emails contained on the defendant's school email system? Yes. When reviewing those emails, were there any relevant communications where he discussed uh, frustration, anger, or uh, his, his opinion of Mrs. Graber? Yes. Uh, could you give us some of the context of those? At one point, Jane Miller missed a couple days of school. He was out on a vacation. He came back. He said that he was supposed to take a makeup test the same day, other students were taking an additional test. He said when he got there that day that he was required not only to take the makeup test, but also the test that was given to the other students that day. Um, he basically walked out of the classroom and went down and reported this incident to the principal. Anything else in his emails that, that were indicative of his state of mind in this period? He told his mother that um, he was very close to losing it. Did he indicate that he was crying? Yes. Mrs. Graber had made him cry? Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that question. Mrs. Graber had made him cry. Showing the witness, pages 22 and 23 of the pre-sentence investigative report. Lieutenant Kinsella, are you familiar with that document? Yes, I am. Your Honor, may I interject an objection? Yes. Clearly. Your Honor, anything contained with this would have been protected information. Um, everything within that appears to be information uh, for counsel or for a, detect a private investigator. Your Honor, this is uh, a sentencing, so the pre-sentence investigative report is relevant for the court's consideration. And you're on page 22? 22 and 23. And is this a document that um, Officer Kinsella would have had access to previously? Lieutenant, have you been provided that in 2021? Yes, sir. Okay, so the reason that I, I think you have a, a solid objection, but if she has already seen the documents, then your Honor, they're they're protected two ways. I think um, you're talking about as a pre-sentence investigation, but also this was client communication 
to an investigator or to a, an attorney potentially that was intercepted, but it's still a protected document. I guess, Mr. Bolden, or to the objection, I will sustain it to the extent that any part of the PSI that this witness does not have access to, um, that she should not have access to, but to any document that she has previously had access to, she may testify to her knowledge of that document. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, may, uh, what I'm stating is that that was the document was written by Mr. Miller to be provided to his counsel. That it is a client protect, it is a protected document, or in this case, to an investigator for counsel. Your Honor, for the course information, that information was provided uh, to law enforcement, and it, it was of great concern uh, to the state to the extent that the subject of that document, Mr. Burnett, had to leave the state out of fear, out of fear and concerns for his own safety. Your Honor, may you be heard response? Yeah, um, go ahead. We can disclose. It's a description of a witness, where that witness lives, and who that witness is. But that jumping to the conclusion that it was some type of, that it was going to be delivered to anyone other than counsel or an investigator is is taking a real leap by the state. It's simply a description of a witness. Isn't Officer Kinsella an investigator? Well, it was written by my client for a private investigator. Your Honor, I only intend to ask the lieutenant what action was taken after she was provided with this document. Your Honor. I guess, counsel, I don't understand the reason we're talking about this at all. So, um, I don't think it's uh, improper to discuss something that this witness has had knowledge of previously. However, she obtained that knowledge. She has this knowledge. Um, I don't know if she has a copy of the PSI right now or not. She's holding that page right now. I guess, Mr. Molding, the easiest thing to do is to take it back and to ask her about her knowledge of the note. So to that extent that that uh, satisfies the objection, it's sustained. But this witness may testify to the knowledge she has based on her investigation. Lieutenant Kinsella, that document and the attached uh, handwritten notes were provided to you? Yes. Um, is it fair to uh, state that this handwritten document um, describes a critical case witness? Yes, it does. John Burnett? Yes. I'm going to read the uh, note out loud and, and if you would um, affirm that this is the same note. John Burnett, six foot one, curly hair, blue eyes, white, always fucking wearing jeans, walks a little funny, swings his hands, old paint chip white pickup with metal lock box in the bed. Doesn't look like any other truck there. Fairfield Public High School starts at 810, ends at 330. He usually comes out of second entrance, entrance, always parks on the left strip instead of main lot, all the way at the end, closest to the school and second entrance. entrance. Is that what you recall? Yes. When you uh, received this document, did you have a meeting with Mr. Burnett? Yes, we did. And uh, what was the context and reason for that meeting? We were concerned for his safety. Why? Because these are, that was a vehicle he drove, that was a description of him, and he was, at that time, the very key witness in this case. Were you concerned for Mr. Burnett's safety? Absolutely. What did Mr. Burnett do after that meeting? Objection as to relevance. Overruled. Oh. What did Mr. Burnett do after you had a meeting with him? He went out of state and stayed with relatives for over a month. Thank you. 
Lieutenant Kinsella, let's talk about the impact on the community of Mrs. Graver's murder for a moment. In the immediate aftermath of her death, what actions were taken by Fairfield Police and, and the Fairfield community at large um, in the days after her death that impacted the community? I think we started with before we actually located Noema Graver's body. Everybody, when we had the, when we went public with the missing person reports, the media got involved. Everybody in Southeast Iowa knew that Noema Graver was missing. Everybody was spun up. Everybody was concerned. Everybody was looking for her. Once we found her body and we did the media release that Mrs. Graver's body had been recovered, we had students that were scared to death to attend class. We had teachers that didn't want to teach for the concerns of their own safety. It was such a concern to the point where the school shut down the schools. They obtained counselors, I think for two and a half days, that they got out early and then for like two and a half days, there was no school. And then when the kids came back to school and teachers came back to school, there were counselors for both the teachers and the staff for the school. In addition to that, we had, as a community as a whole, we have stakeholders. We're a small community. We have key personnel, whether it's for the hospital, other health care providers, whether it's the hospital, mental health awareness, any place that anybody goes, such as the well, to get services or ask for help. We made sure that everybody had a complete list of mental health providers, of various services that we thought that anybody else would need in the community to take care of the well-being of our community. Um, I think that obviously it was destroyed um, Chayden's family, this incident. It's destroyed Jeremy's family. Um, it's destroyed Noema's family. Um, it has destroyed, our community is considered safe, we're kinder, we're gentler. That's the gist of our community. That's what we take pride in. And I think this incident shattered that belief for a lot of people. It took their safety, their well-being of the general public and just stripped it of everybody, from everybody as a result of this. You know, there's, we're still continuing to have school safety meetings to upgrade the safety protocols in the school. Some of that came because of the school shootings nationally and we got funding for it. But the other parts of this, making sure all the schools were aware of critical incident responses, how the police were gonna go, where everybody was going to go, um, just that everybody was on the same sheet of music. We continue to do those things. We still have meetings today with the safety, well-being. Every time that we've had a court proceeding, we make sure that there are safe falls in, in place for our community so that we can take care of the community as a whole and their well-being. Thank you, Lieutenant. Just one more uh, thing I want to ask you about here. Jaden was arrested and his cell phone was taken from him, right? Yes, sir. At a certain point, his cell phone was returned to his family? Yes. Was there an incident after Chayden Miller was arrested where um, his SNAP map was activated? Yes. Could you tell us uh, about the impact of that? When the phone activated, it showed that Chayden Miller was at his residence. We had numerous students, various people from the community calling us and say, ask, asking whether Chayden Miller had been released from jail. People thought he got out? Yes, people thought he got out. What was the general tenor of, of their concern? Concern for their own safety. Lieutenant Gazella, how has the death of Mrs. Graver changed their system? I don't think that our community will ever be the same again. I Thank think it's know. devastated us. All right, any further questions? Cross-examination. At the time of arrest in November of 2021, uh, Jeremy Goodall was taller than Jay Miller. Yes. Uh, heavier. Yes. A grade ahead. Yes. Uh, a 
more accomplished athlete? Yes. And more popular? Yes. And through your investigation, you did confirm that uh, Chad Miller had a, a meeting about his grades with Ms. Graber? Yes. Uh, that he had done a substantial amount of homework recently? The emails that I saw was that he was committed to getting um, his homework done and at times he'd spent several hours with both a tutor and trying to get his missing assignments completed. Whether they were completed or not, I don't know that. I have no further questions. <coughs> Despite all those things, Jaden Miller, whether he's done his homework that night or not, planned and executed the murder of Mrs. Graber. Yes. <coughs> Anything else for this witness council? No, Your Honor. Thank you. You can step down. Anything else the state would like to offer, say, in a matter of sentence? Judge, um as I indicated, the four witnesses that we've called, uh, that completes our presentation with regard to any evidence um, that relates to, that we have from the case from those witnesses that relates to the factors that we've mentioned before that the court has to consider in um, fashioning a sentence for the defendant. So we have um, impact statements uh, later uh, once the court gets to that and our recommendation, I know the defense has uh, several witnesses as well, but at this point, we have no further witnesses to call. And Ms. Branstead, um, witnesses on behalf of the defense? Your Honor, the defense is offering uh, no additional evidence. Okay, um, then I'm going to go back to the state because uh, I'm going to have the state make any further comments regarding what the recommendation for sentence is, and then I'll have the defendant or the defense counsel do the same. Then I'll give the defendant an opportunity to make a statement if he wishes to, and then we'll go on with the victim impact statement. Judge, as far as our recommendation, is that correct? Yes. All right, just briefly. Um, the state is uh, recommending that uh, Willard uh, Chayden uh, Miller be sentenced to a term uh, of incarceration of life with parole uh, with a minimum sentence. to be imposed of 30 years. Uh, the reasons for that sentence and that minimum in particular uh, are many actually. 
actually, Judge. Um, most of those reasons have been on full display uh, this morning whenever we put on our presentation with regard to the evidence um, that relates from uh, Agent Valletta, Agent Kedley, um, Officer Kinsella, as well as uh, Mike Henrissey from, uh, from Oakdale. So I just want to focus on several of these factors that are listed in 902.1 2B 2A. Uh, first of all, the impact of the offense on the victims in this case, which is the Graber family, who is seated right behind me. Um, the Gravers have suffered immensely in this case uh, and at the hands of this defendant. Um, I will tell the court that Paul Graber, uh, Noema's, uh, Noema's husband, passed away uh, within the last few days. His funeral was yesterday. So not only does this family having to endure um, this particular sentencing hearing, uh, they have now lost another important member of their family and a loved one. And certainly our condolences uh, go out to that family uh, at this time. But so the impact on them could not be greater. Uh, they will detail for you in, in victim impact statements later specifically what that is. I will tell you that in my experience as a prosecutor for 30 plus years that the families and the people who know the victim are the best people to inform the court as to how that has impacted them and devastated their life. I will tell you that all of them, this is my characterization I would say, are having to uh, endure a new normal uh, for them uh, in the absence of Noema and Paul uh, Graber. So that the impact of the offense on each of these victims will be detailed. Um, the other factors I can, uh, some of them I can lump together. Um, the impact of the offense on the community was most best articulated here by Officer Kinsella. Uh, the degree of the participation in the murder uh, by the defendant, the nature of the offense, the heinous and brutal and cruel nature and manner of the murder are on full display in this sentencing hearing. This was a cruel, heinous act by two defendants, by not only Mr. Miller, I know that Mr. Goodale's, uh, the, uh, Goodale's um, sentencing is coming up later this year, uh, but you, you look at this and it's like, what could be worse than what these two guys did? It's, it, is, uh, it is cruel to the nth degree. Uh, I cannot imagine anything uh, really worse uh, than to be attacked in the manner that she was for what? A grade. It's, it's just beyond um, the pale, in, in, in my opinion. Um, this defendant had, even though he's young, has full capacity to understand what he did in, in, uh, based upon the evidence that we have in this case. Um, by many accounts in the PSI that I've read, the statement from his mother uh, that, I, that, I've, that I've reviewed, um, he had a lot more support in his life than a lot of other kids his age, and yet he still, this is how he dealt with his problem. Um, if this were something normal and usual, it, this would happen a lot more than it does. Um, so based upon his history and that, that I've seen, the fact that he was relatively a good student in high school, um, it, it's again just beyond the pale that, that this was the way that he would have chosen to deal uh, with um, his, his grade. It, there is evidence in this record that it was his idea, that it was planned, that he recruited Jeremy Goodale to, to help him. I will tell you that absent Wilbur Miller, based upon the evidence in this case, Noema Graber is alive today. Um, Jeremy Goodale, although he committed heinous acts against her as well, uh, was recruited by the defendant. This was his idea. It was planned out. Everyone needs to get that. Um, and it, it's because it, the evidence in this case is just simply uh, overwhelming. Um, he will have a chance at some point in his life 
uh, depending on the sentence that you give. And we're asking for a 30-year minimum here. Uh, but that gets him to about the mid-40s uh, before he's actually eligible for parole. Uh, the top part of the sentence is life. Um, he could spend the rest of his life in prison depending on how he behaves and uh, you know, the nature and the makeup of the parole board. Who knows what that's going to be however many years uh, down the road. But I will tell you that based upon the evidence in this case, uh, based upon what we know about this case, what's been proven about this case, what you've heard from law enforcement about this case, and all the other evidence in this case, this defendant deserves every day he gets in prison, every single one. And he should get a 30-year minimum. Uh, that is what is warranted in this case, is what is justice in this case. And we ask that you impose a 30-year minimum with the top uh, part of the sentence being life with the possibility of parole. Uh, thank you. under 903B. Um, Chauncey was just mentioning to me there may be some other amounts that you did not mention. We had gotten a, a uh, somewhat late filed uh, crime victim restitution claim. Um, so the state would just request 30 days for any additional and final uh, tallies to come in on that prior to closing the, uh, the record on restitution. Okay, so you're requesting that I not order any other restitution other than the uh, the 9103B, $150,000 until you have a chance to file a final pecuniary damage statement. Is that correct? Well, there, there is the, the claims already in the record. I just believe that there is at least one additional one that may be claimed or filed within the next day or two. Okay. So we can leave that open or, or order what's in the PSR. But. I'll hold that open for 30 days um, and then I'll get the defense's uh, position on how they want me to address the restitution that's not required right now. Uh, with regard to the defense's recommendation on sentencing, Ms. Branson. Your Honor, I think the better part of today has been spent uh, trying to show that Mr. Miller is guilty, and he is. Um, he has provided a statement that is within the, the pre-sentence investigation. Uh, where he goes through in great detail how he started out as dark jokes and a plan that just went forward. Uh, he admits providing the bat. He admits being a lookout. He admits participation. Uh, there is some disagreement about whether or not uh, he had the bat and struck the first blow. And Your Honor, I think the evidence uh, supports what um, Mr. Miller has said. Uh, there was no blood on him. There was blood on Mr. Goodale. And even the description within Mr. Goodale's statements was that he drug the body away and had the bat with him. Well, Mr. Miller stood lookout. Well, that doesn't make any sense unless he had the bat at first. You wouldn't take the bat from the person who had it if you also then had to carry something. That is just a small, small part of participation, but that may be our only factual disagreement. Um, I think there was some discussion about the impact on the family and the community, um, and with the possibility for parole. And Your Honor, we're looking at um, the Lyle case, at Roby, which is at 897 Northwest 2nd, 127, 
and May, which is a 2017 case, and then Majors, which is at 940 Northwest 2nd to 372, and that's a 2020 case. Um, each of those indicate that the burden is on the state to bring expert testimony and sentencing to support any request for a mandatory minimum sentence. Um, those are both very clear that a mandatory minimum for a juvenile should be rare, should be the exception, and needs to be supported by expert testimony. Uh, those cases uh, are very clear that the heinous nature of the crime does not um, over, overtake, does not put aside the need for expert testimony as to the juvenile factors. There is a statement made by the state that Mr. Miller has full capacity. That requires expert testimony. That is not something that is shown simply by showing intelligence. Intelligence and maturity are not the same, and maturation is the number one factor looked at within each of these cases. In fact, the words are exceptional maturity. Um, there just simply isn't that type of evidence. And in fact, when you look at the evidence talking about how this started and a grade, if you, that is, exemplifies immature thinking. I, I think there's very clear evidence that Jane Miller was very wrapped up in thinking about his grades. In some ways, very normal. He had meetings. He was seeing a counselor about it. He had talked to his mother about it. Uh, he had said he was starting to lose it about the grade. He had a, a tutor. He was meeting with his teacher. He then took steps that were both juvenile and immature, and then criminal, making dark jokes about I could just kill the teacher. And I don't think there's any reason to believe that that's exactly what those were when he started at that point. That's how they were taken by his friends. Um, that's what Willard Miller says it started as. And then something developed out of that. There is no doubt that Jane Miller has pled guilty. There's no doubt that he's guilty, but the question is, should he still have those juvenile factors in place? And to get past that, and I just can't emphasize that enough, there is no evidence in front of this court and the state has not met the burden for a mandatory minimum. Uh, I'm looking at Roby, and it recognizes specifically that sentencing hearings for juveniles in adult court are not adversarially, are not necessarily adversary. The goal is to craft a sentence in the best interest of the child. That the default rule is that a juvenile is not subject to minimum periods of incarceration. Um, and that the seriousness of the criminal act is not such that um, is not enough to conclude a mandatory term is appropriate. Uh, Roby goes on to say a sentence without, well that was without parole eligibility should be very uncommon. But again, it addresses those mandatories. Uh, Uh, Roby emphasizes the juvenile sentencing factors, um, and those are, of course, the Lyle factors, and that they must be used in, um, in determining any type of mandatory minimum. Um, and re again, Roby re says that without expert te testimony to support the mandate mandatory minimums, each factor has to be analyzed in those contexts. Um, as I said, the 20- Page 31. Um, Your Honor, I'm looking at notes here. Okay. 
um, and these are my own notes. Um, I might be able to find them. So, and I think the exact words is within both majors and within rugby is there is a presumption against a mandatory minimum for a juvenile. There is um, additional support in Zarat, Z-A-R-A-T-E, which is 908 Northwest 2nd, 801. Um, and where the court found, and that's a 2018 case, a sentencing court with a predisposition for mandatory minimum sentences for a murder conviction may not use that predisposition, may not allow that. Uh, predisposition to outweigh juvenile sentencing factors. Um, and I would, I'm trying not to repeat myself, but the cases somewhat repeat themselves. Uh, Majors states the importance of expert testimony for mandatory minimums. Uh, as stated, Roby was directed at the state, and that was a case in which um, there was a question as to whether or not the defense had the, the burden to bring an expert. Um, if the state wants to argue uh, outside the uh, presumption for uh, no mandatory minimum, they have to apply the expert, uh, the lie factors, and expert testimony is usually needed um, as a prerequisite to depart from normal sentencing presumptions against mandatory minimums. And, Your Honor, uh, it is, uh, Roby is at page 144, and that's requiring the defense to, um, or sorry, Your Honor, the exact quote here for that one is, re we reiterate that sentencing hearings need not be a battle of experts. Basic proposition regarding this process is that juvenile sentencing hearings are not entirely adversarial. The goal is to, create, is to craft punishment that serves the best interests of the child and society, and it requires, um, and then again, uh, Majors talks about that the defense is not required to present an expert, but I think that the implication there is that the state does have that burden. Um, here, there we go. Um, the quote, our emphasis in Brody on the importance of presenting expert <coughs> testimony on the miller lyle Brody factors was directed at the state. If the state wants to recommend that the sentencing court impose a mandatory minimum sentence, Roby held that an expert is normally necessary to analyze the factors. Um, and that quotes, um, that's within majors and quoting Roby at page 148. There were a number of pieces of evidence presented to show uh, that Mr. Miller participated in a murder, he did, um, that he did not tell the truth when he was initially interviewed, he didn't. Uh, much of that, though, shows some very juvenile behavior. Um, his responses um, were that of a juvenile in many, many ways. And I want to emphasize, my client is now six foot four. He was, according to one of the police reports, five foot six, according to my client, five foot eight, when he was arrested. Um, he may look like an adult based on his height, but he was a 16 year old. And his behaviors certainly show that of a 16 year old. Um, Ms. Brinson, I'm sorry I'm interrupting you, but 
I, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding your interpretation of state versus majors. Yes. Because that was a case that was sent back to the district court for resentencing after a mandatory minimum was imposed. Um, then on remand, a district court judge resentenced the defendant to the same sentence for attempted murder. Um, and then that was appealed. And the holding of the Iowa Supreme Court in state versus majors uh, was that imposition of a mandatory minimum sentence of 17 and one half years was not an abuse of discretion. And trial court did not have the duty to present an expert witness to testify regarding juvenile sentencing factors. Are you saying that that only applies to you as trial counsel? Or if that you're saying applies to that the state still has to present expert testimony if they're asking for a mandatory minimum? The state does still have to present expert testimony absent, um, well, that is the norm. Um, that no, but, that, but there's a difference. Yes. It, I mean, if it's the norm or whether or not I am, you think I am just prohibited from considering a mandatory minimum today because there hasn't been expert testimony. I don't think that's what the cases say. I, I think that it says unless there is something, um, I, I think it does say that within this case. that the burden is on the state and that the Miller, uh, Lyle, and Roby factors are, it's incumbent upon the state to show that those factors have been met. And in this case, I don't think there's been any evidence that, that would overcome the need for an expert. Um, I think that the uh, defense does not bear that same burden. And I think it stands to, for that proposition that the defense doesn't have that burden, but I don't think it takes that off of the state. And there has to be something specific to maturation um, and specifically at least within the realm of what an expert would show. I don't think that becomes um, lay evidence based on that. I, from my reading of it, Majors doesn't take any burden off the state. Uh, it simply addresses the defense um, burden. And Your Honor, Roby is even more specific um, as to the burden on the state. And Roby remains good law as well. I think majors becomes a little bit more confusing because it's dealing more with the defense um, burden, so you, you have to look a little bit more within the dicta of majors.
Your Honor. Yeah. As as I'm reading it, and so um, the files in the factors in Lyle are mitigating factors. Um, none of those become exacerbating factors absent expert testimony. And Your Honor, if I look at um, you know, State v. Majors does say our emphasis in Roby on the importance of presenting expert testimony on the Miller, Lyle, and Roby factors was directed at the state. If the state wants to recommend that the sentencing court impose a mandatory minimum sentence, Roby held that an expert is normally necessary to analyze the factors. So, I mean, it says normally necessary. It doesn't just say is the normal, it says it's normally necessary. And that is at me in uh, State Majors at 392. Anything else, uh, Ms. Brand said regarding uh, defendant's recommendation of sentence? Your Honor, um, and just because there was a quite a bit of emphasis on Mr. Goodale's proper statement, um, going to the weight of that, there's pretty clear Iowa Supreme Court precedent that indicates um, a proffer is inherently unreliable. Um, I have a number of cases, uh, but State versus Brown, 397 Northwest 2nd, 689. State versus DeWitt, 286 Northwest 379. Uh, are clear that when a bargain is made for testimony, especially an accomplice's testimony, that the statement is tainted and reliable and is um, often inadmissible against a co-defendant. In this case, um, you know, certainly we're at sentencing, there are different rules of evidence, but the weight of that evidence, um, certainly we'd ask the court to give that no weight and to look instead at the <coughs> statement made uh, by Mr. Uh, Miller in his uh, pre-sentence investigation and the corroborating physical evidence, as well as the recorded statements of Jeremy Goodell in the Snapchat that was provided to the court. That goes to one small factor here, Your Honor, but I do think it is um, a somewhat important factor to look at in this case. Um, Mr. Miller's aware that he's looking at incarceration, but he is asking that this court not impose a mandatory minimum. Thank you. We're going to take our afternoon recess at this time. Take uh, 10 minutes.
Please be seated, everyone. Get those started. So we have ten of them. Um, 
knowing that I came from a large and extended family, all of these 10 qualify. I believe they're either um, siblings, in-laws, or um, children. That's where they would all, I think, fit in those categories. So um, several of them are going to be read by Sarah Harms, who is a, uh, the victim witness coordinator in my office. Um, others will be read uh, personally, and there's at least one I know that another family member has been designated to read another family member's uh, statement. So that's kind of generally how we'll approach this. Um, the first up, there will be two that will be read by Ms. Harms, uh, Marilyn Foos, and then Norbert Foos, who are in-laws, correct? correct. So um, we'll start with uh, Marilyn first, if that's okay. became her friend if he, she wasn't already. The only exceptions being the two who stole her from the thousands who loved her. She had a way of lighting up the room when she entered. That was because she genuinely cared about every person. People called Noema an angel when they spoke of her. She had more than 50 godchildren, maybe 56, but she didn't broadcast the fact. Instead, she chose to live her love for them and anyone in need without thought of self. She never spoke of her good deeds, but lived the gospel every day with her big, joyful, loving heart. She was a private person in that way, not at all self-seeking, but her personality truly did make everyone feel lighter. When Noema first joined the Graber family, English was tricky. It was hard to understand her speech unless you listen very carefully and patiently. It was difficult to hold a meaningful conversation for those early years, yet she did not give up. Noema mastered the English language to the degree of becoming a full, competent, and indeed exceptional teacher. Her favorite classes surely were with the Spanish students whom she amused and entranced with tales of her beloved Mexico, all the while teaching them to speak an important language and broaden their understanding of the world's potential for them, if only they would be diligent. Noema loved people. She prayed earnestly for them. She treasured her faith and never gave up her love for God, but instead pressed into him when troubles came. She helped so many, so often, so well. She knew how to love. Noema's husband, my brother Paul, missed her so deeply. I am convinced that hastened his very recent death. We all miss her cheerful voice, her deep throaty belly laugh when something was funny, the way she pursed her lips into an O when she was thinking about the word that was just right. She mercifully forgiving, she was a mercifully forgiving person who did not harbor ill will when wronged, but she did stand up for truth. She tried so hard to help people succeed, whether in their walk with God or in this life. She was an absolute blessing and an angel for sure. The next statement I'm gonna read is from Norbert Fust who was Noema's brother-in-law. Noema Graber was a very special person that I have had the privilege to know in my lifetime. She was a caring, selfless individual who had the best for those who were struggling and needed care. St. Francis once said, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Noema Graber was the best example of this by her love for her fellow man. 
After her death, we heard so many stories of her selfless giving with the care of the less fortunate. This was especially true in the Hispanic community who needed help and direction in living in Iowa. Noema and her beloved church was that lighthouse of hope to those who were less privileged and needed a direction and help to succeed. Noema's faith was strong and this motivated her to care for others. What especially was impressive was her ability to teach others with passion. I have been associated with education for almost 30 years. Many teachers have been great educators, but not many educators have a passion for their students themselves. Noema taught with excellence and with a caring attitude for the students themselves, becoming a person they could receive advice from. She knew that life in this world was not easy, and you need to work hard and diligently if you want to succeed. The death of Noema has had a profound impact on her immediate family, and we believe that this contributed to the untimely death of her husband, Paul. But now we have a situation where three, three children who may someday be married and possibly have children without the ability of having these spouses or children know their parents. Plus, they will have to take care of one of their siblings who has special needs. I am confident you have heard what a special individual Noe McGregor was. The ability she had to live a life that God was proud of and her selfless acts that is very hard to replace, especially for what she did for the Hispanic community in her area. It is a complete travesty to have two young people take the life of Noema Graber deliberately and away from so many. Judge, the next victim impact statement is Tom Graber, who was the brother-in-law of Noema Graber. This case has had an enormous impact <clears throat> on Noema's family, Fairfield High School, and the Fairfield community at large. Not only was Noema robbed of 30-some of the best years of her life, her murder deprived Paul Graber of the love of his life and certainly hastened Paul's own premature death. It has also had major impacts in the lives of their children, Christian, Jared and Noema Marie. In the spring of 2021, Paul had just endured more than five years of dialysis, a side effect of his severe diabetes, and received a miraculous kidney transplant. Things were at last looking up. Finally untethered from the dialysis machine, he was looking forward to resuming <clears throat> travel with Noema and their son Jared visiting eldest son Christian, who then lived in Spain, and Noe Marie, Marie, who was working in Europe, and family and friends in Mexico. Instead, Willard Shaden Miller ruthlessly murdered Noema a few months later. Paul was deeply and understandably depressed by the murder of Noema, and his life ended last week in the ravages <clears throat> of a metastatic cancer that would have been caught and treated far sooner had Noema been there. I am certain from knowing Noema for more than 35 years that she would have made Paul see the doctor much sooner for the new pains and skin lesions <clears throat> he began experiencing late last year. She would not have let him ignore these symptoms and she would have insisted he get them checked. Instead, <clears throat> depressed as he was over this map, over her murder, he delayed seeking treatment until the very end of March, and now is dead at the early age of 68. Proof <clears throat> of that depression and the impact of Noema's murder can be seen in Paul's conduct. In January 2022, just three months after the murder, and again this May, my brothers Bill and John 
who do not, neither of whom lives in Fairfield, almost forcibly had to take Paul to the hospital, to the emergency room at Jefferson County Health Center for acute care, without which he very likely would have died on each of those occasions. The first episode was COVID related. He was living at home with, <clears throat> he was lying at home with the disease, alone and without energy enough to even raise his cell phone to his ear to answer it. They became concerned and drove to Fairfield to check on him. The second episode involved a near fatal spike in his potassium levels after essentially ceasing to eat or drink for days this past spring. I know of these both directly from being on the phone with Bill and John during them. As Paul told me March 31st, as we sat together at the University of Iowa hospitals, waiting <clears throat> several hours for his room to become available. He'd been having several vivid dreams recently in which he saw Noema, who gave him signs he interpreted as telling him that his time was coming, that it was drawing near, but it was not yet his time to go to her. And she was on his mind a great deal, and he spoke of her often. Had Paul not been so depressed from the murder of Noema, and, and had she been there to assist him, he, she would have helped him deal with the side effects of his cancer surgery, would have prepared irresistible meals, he would have insisted, and she would have insisted he eat and drink. Even more importantly, had she been there, she would have insisted he seek care last year, when the cancer would have been far more easily treatable. She would have made certain he saw a doctor. Instead, without Noema, no treatment was sought until too late. Willard Shade Miller's murder of Noema played a very important role in the premature death of Paul Graber. The murder also deprived the family of its primary breadwinner. Paul had been disabled for more than 20 years due to extensive nerve damage to his feet and legs from the ravages of severe diabetes. Noema stepped up, obtained a bachelor's degree from Iowa Wesleyan and a teacher's her teaching certificate and became the family's primary source of income. Noema's murder has been very difficult for their adult special needs son, Jared, who has a severe genetic disorder. He wanted to be here today, but was admitted Monday <clears throat> to the University of Iowa hospitals on an emergency basis. And Jared and his mother were particularly close and loved each other's company dearly, going to church every week and visiting family and friends in Mexico most summers and occasionally to Europe using funds that Noema frugally saved from her salary as a school teacher. Willard Shade and Miller put an end to that. The murder has also caused great change in the lives of their other children, Christian and Noema Marie. Self-supporting adults both interrupted their lives to come home and help Paul in his illness and to help care for Jared. Christian this year has already taken more than 12 weeks unpaid leave from his job as an international medical courier in order to help his dad. And he's in the midst of planning <clears throat> further changes to facilitate his taking over as guardian for his disabled younger brother, Jared. That had not been the original plan. No, Mother Noema was the rock of the family. She was the primary caregiver for Jared. She was in very good health, had a long life ahead of her. Willard Shade Miller put an end to all that too. Indeed, not only had Noema been a devoted wife and loving mother, mother, putting herself through college in her 50s, she taught for several years in Ottumwa and was in her 10th year of teaching at Fairfield High School when struck down. There she's remembered by her many hundreds of students and their families who have embedded a large granite monument to her in the wall of the high school at the end of a hallway near her classroom. Established and funded scholarships in her name, <clears throat> held candlelight vigils in her memory, packed the high school auditorium at her evening prayer and vigil service, created beautiful works of art in her memory, and left flowers in a reserved auditorium seat at numerous student concerts and performances in her memory, and an appreciation of the support she had always given her students 
in their out-of-classroom endeavors. <clears throat> Area high schools also honored her, sending gifts and condolences to FHS, and wearing orange and black team uniforms at their own games in support of the grieving students and staff at rival FHS. Memorials were also placed at the public library and elsewhere in town, and permanent memorials at Chautauqua Park, as well as the school. The governor of the state of Iowa ordered all <clears throat> flags on state property flown at half staff from dawn until sunset in her honor. Such honors are not extended to ordinary people. Noema led an extraordinary life of service. In addition to her nurturing roles at home and at school, Noema was very active in the Catholic community, attending Mass daily, recited the rosary every Friday evening with a group of women, a number of whom are here with us at the hearing, and became a liaison between the church and the growing Hispanic community of Fairfield. Noema helped many find or come back to the church and when the son of Elizabeth Goitia was diagnosed with a brain tumor 14 years ago, Noema prayed with her every day. Ms. Goitia's son beat doctor's expectations and ultimately beat his tumor, and he was there in attendance at the prayer and vigil service for Noema in the high school auditorium. Noema encouraged others to return to college and finish their education helped them find scholarships and pointed out that she herself had earned her degree in her, while in her 50s, so they could too. Willard Shade Miller put an end to all that religious and community service too. The difficulties with Willard Shade Miller began earlier in the year. After the egging and rock throwing at Noema's house homecoming weekend, which broke a window, I heard from Paul about this dark haired kid who sat in or near the front row of her class, his book closed, rarely participating, just sitting there glaring malevolently at Noema. She tried many ways to reach him, but nothing seemed to work. She'd also met with his parents. Nothing seemed to work. Never before had she had a student she couldn't reach. That student was Willard Shaden Miller. He planned Noema's murder over at least two weeks, Googled what happens to a student's grade when the professor cannot finish the term, wrote out a plan for, her, for the murder, created a checklist of need, needed murder supplies, and enlisted a confederate to help him. Paul repeatedly told me, even before we knew any of the facts of the case, that there had to be at least two persons involved. Noema was a fighter. She would not have given up. No single person could have overpowered her alone. Those two learned Noema's daily routines, stalked her, watched her on her daily walks at Chautauqua Park, and in the very afternoon of the murder, Willard Shane Miller and his mother met with Noema at the high school. And there, Miller promised Noema's, er, sought Noema's help in accomplishing his desire to study abroad in a Spanish-speaking country, as his older sister had. Noema agreed to provide further help, help he'd previously spurned, and Miller promised to exert extra effort and really try harder in his class. His mother described the meeting as beautiful, full of sweetness, positivity, and promise. All the while, Willard Shaden Miller knew his promise was false, knew he didn't intend to try harder. Instead, he intended to murder Noema that very afternoon, and that is exactly what he did. While his confederate distracted Noema from the front, Willard Jaden Miller cowardly snuck up behind Noema and crushed her skull with a metal baseball bat. Willard Jaden Miller has shown no remorse. He certainly didn't on the night of the murder. Instead, he went home, did homework, had dinner with the family, just another routine day. He also didn't show remorse on the day of his arrest. Not even after his mother reminded him he was being videotaped and recorded and instructed him, also, we need to express a little more remorse that your teacher is dead. I'm kind of surprised at your reaction. No contrition, no remorse. Again, at his plea hearing a year and a half ago, I'm sorry, a year and a half later, 
He still refused to own up to his full role in this horrific crime. He's <clears throat> refusing to admit that he struck Noema. And again today, I did not hear any admission from him to what he actually did. Using his own baseball bat, no less. To this day, it's clear to me that he feels no genuine remorse. No doubt he's sorry for himself, sorry he's here, sorry for what's coming, perhaps sorry for his family. But I don't believe he feels genuine remorse for slaughtering Noe McGraver. A student's murder of his teacher over a mere grade should also weigh heavily in favor of a heavy sentence. Society cannot stand such crimes. They must be deterred. You've heard eloquent testimony this afternoon from Lieutenant Kinsella of local teachers and even students fearing for their lives as a result of this crime. Well, it extends beyond this state. I have a daughter who's a university professor in a different state. She recently disclosed to me that this crime has caused her to fear some of her male students who are failing. The impact of this crime on the community and society are factors calling for a maximum sentence. Your Honor, Willard Shade Miller deserves every day of a life sentence with no consideration for, for parole until he has actually served at least 30 years in prison. I discussed this topic with Paul on multiple occasions, back in January and February of this year, and again in April, prior to the plea hearings. On those occasions, Paul repeatedly stressed to me the importance of Defendant Miller receiving a sentence of life in prison with no possibility of consideration for parole until he had served at least 30 plus years of that sentence. 35 years was the time Paul thought required, but at a minimum, it had to start with the three. I had independently landed on 35 years also. Given the utterly cold-blooded depravity of this crime, committed less than two hours after meeting face-to-face -face with her at the school, seeking her help, falsely, when all the time knowing he was about to murder her, calls for the maximum, near the maximum sentence possible. Coupled with Miller's central role as the instigator, planner, and principal actor, cowardly sneaking up behind and striking the critical first blows, a crime that would not have occurred but for Willard Jaden Miller. The wide ramifications of this crime, Miller's lack of remorse, and his refusal to date to admit his full role. I believe Willard Jaden Miller should be sentenced to life in prison with a requirement that he actually served no less than 35 years before becoming eligible to be considered for the possibility of parole. Uh, the next victim in that statement is Barbara Graver, read by Tommy Graver, correct? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Dear Judge Showers, Noya was a warm, selfless, incredible woman who dedicated herself to her community. She was brimming with love and energy that she shared with all around her. Her adoring family, her students, and members of her church in her town's Latino community. I first met Noema when my brother-in-law Paul brought Noema to Iowa to meet our family. In 1986, she married Paul, first in a civil ceremony in Chicago where my husband and I hosted a reception followed by a beautiful church ceremony in Jalapa, Veracruz, Mexico. I've always admired her for how much she has accomplished for herself and her family. She began her career in Mexico City as a flight attendant and then trained to be a pilot for Mexicana Airlines. Shortly after her marriage to my brother-in-law, she made the decision to move to Fairfield, Iowa and devote herself to raising her three children. She loved being a mother. It was her true vocation. But when her family needed her support, her disabled husband and special needs child, she enrolled in college, retrained, and began a career as a Spanish teacher. Noama found joy in all of her jobs and excelled at each of them. It was a joy to have her as my sister-in-law. I missed so much the long walks we would take in the countryside, and I missed joking with her. 
I loved telling her my favorite Mexican food was Taco John's. I always got the same response. She laughed and said, oh no, Barbara, not to my country. <laughs> the impact of her death on her family is immeasurable. Eight months prior to her murder, Paul received a new kidney. At last, after years of dialysis, things were looking up for the Graber family. Their prayers had been answered, and Noema and Paul were planning trips abroad in time to truly enjoy their golden years. Her death put an end to so much promise for the future. I believe Mr. Miller's actions has had a direct impact on the health of my brother-in-law. The all-consuming grief of losing the love of his life led him to ignore early symptoms of an illness that, caught early, could have been easily treated. Sadly, he has now passed away. Noema's youngest son has significant special and medical needs. Noema worked tirelessly to meet his needs and to improve his life. She brought the world to him. She took him to church and on international trips to visit family. And she did all she could to enrich his life. I constantly worry about what's next for him and her other children. It's so cruel they will not have their mother when they get married or have their own children. I grew up in Gettinger, a small farming town in northwest Iowa, and left the state following college. Mr. Miller's actions destroyed my idealized childhood memories of rural Iowa being a place where townspeople truly did love and care for their neighbors. Evil didn't live in Iowa. Mr. Miller shattered that illusion. I wish Mr. Miller no harm as he pays his debt to society. It is difficult for me to forgive him because I'm not certain he's truly repentant of his actions. He needs to admit his part in Noema's murder and not blame others. However, if he takes responsibility and is sincerely repentant, I could, for I could for find forgiveness. Noema could conceivably have lived another 30 years. I would have liked to see Mr. Miller live those years behind bars according to the plea agreement between the prosecutor and defense, a life sentence with a minimum of 30 years served before the possibility of parole. I hope Mr. Miller can find ways to improve himself while incarcerated by furthering his education, learning a trade, finding faith, and at a minimum, asking for and receiving God's forgiveness. It would be ironic if he gained fluency in Spanish. Finally, my thanks and gratitude to the following. Jefferson County Attorney Chauncey Molding and his staff, the Fairfield Police Department, and Jefferson County Law Enforcement Officers, Iowa Assistant Attorney General Scott Brown and his staff, the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation, the State Coroner and staff, Victims Advocate Personnel, Judge Sean Showers and his court officers, Father Nick and the staff and parishioners of St. Mary's Catholic Church, and Noema's many friends in Fairfield. You guide us through the most difficult time with gentle hands. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, impact statement is Jim Graber, who is a brother in law. As you've heard already, New England had a lot of impact on a lot of people, and it only took two people to actually remove her from our lives just like that. Um, everybody loved her. Maybe she was a tough Spanish teacher, but she wanted the best for her students. If you take a class, you should be able to focus. Spanish is usually the easy class in a lot of schools. I can remember that back in my day. But to fathom somebody killing somebody over a grave is just insane. Noema is one of the kindest, dearest pe persons I've ever known. I've known her for a long time. She'd go out of her way for anybody. And most of the town of Fairfield can approve to that, attest to that. Um, because of this event, it not only affects the immediate family, it affects the other generations of the family. We have grandkids that are four, eight, ten, eight, and four that live in the Quad Cities with us. And we've had to explain to them what murder is. And my daughter has had to take extra precautions because now she's nervous about it too. She's not comfortable walking in their neighborhoods in case some creeps out there. So 
it's effect, it affects a long ways, and like they said earlier, it affects Fairfield a great deal. Um, I agree too. I've listened to the testimony. I've been here to nearly every hearing, and to this date, this is the first time I've ever heard an, some type an attempted apology for Mr. Miller. Um, I don't believe it because he showed no sign of remorse whatsoever. Um, he, to me, he's a cold-blooded, premeditated murder. Murderer. Noemi had a good life, but she had a lot of good life left. Um, her death definitely sped up Paul's demise, and it affected their immediate family greatly. Um, I would too definitely recommend judge a minimum sentence of 30 to 35 years and a maximum sentence of life. Um, it's only right. He took a lot of good life out of her and has affected a lot of life out of the rest of us that remain. I would also say that I hope you open your soul to the Lord and maybe ask for forgiveness there first because you're on a spiral straight to hell. That's it. Oh, one thing. There would be a testimony or a victim statement from my brother Paul. It's his obituary from the funeral yesterday. The next impact statement is Deanne Graber, who is a sister in law. This will be read by Sarah Harms as well. from Deanne Graber. My name is Deanne Graber, and Noema Graber was my sister-in-law, and I am married to her husband's brother, Jim. There are no adequate words to describe fully what this horrific, senseless murder of my sweet sister-in-law has meant, not only to the large Graber family who loved and adored her for countless reasons, but also Noema's large family in Mexico who cherished their oldest sister and aunt as well, along with extended family from both sides. I am so thankful that neither set of parents were still alive and had to be told of the despicable evil that transcended on their precious daughter on November 2nd of 2021. Hundreds of family members miss her every day, along with thousands of friends. I will never be able to forget the evening Paul called my husband to tell him Noema was missing. We were at our daughter's for dinner and I was playing a game with my eight and six year old grandsons when my husband's cell phone rang. I could tell by the sound of his voice that it was a serious, concerning call and was not going to be good news. When he hung up, he said, Noema's missing in the most shocked voice. My six-year-old grandson, Wesley, said, Gigi, what does missing mean? This would be the beginning of what would become a devastating loss of innocence for my two grandsons, Ethan, eight, and Wesley, six. Because not only did I have to explain in detail what it meant for their sweet great aunt to go missing and pray for her safe return, but the very next day, we would sadly have to introduce a vile word murder to their vocabulary at such a tender age. Definitely one of the hardest emotional conversations of our lives that literally made me sick to my stomach. They had so many questions that we could not begin to answer. No one could at that point and still can't. And we know it will continue. All we could do was grieve and pray like never before. Just last week, on June 21st, 2023, I was at a park in Bettendorf near my grandson's home. It's one of my favorite things to do with them on our midweek visit. Last Wednesday, on our walk back to the car, Wesley, now eight, saw a bronze marker on a tree near a couple of bench benches and an overlook of the creek. He stopped to read it and asked why a lady's name was on it. I explained that she had died and her family had planted a tree in the park in her memory. 
because it had been a favorite place of her when she was alive. He wanted to know how she died. I told him, the plaque doesn't say, but maybe it was a car accident or illness. He immediately said, I know. I asked, how? He made his hands in the shape of a gun and hit himself in the head with it and said, murder. I stopped in stunned silence and knew exactly why he said this. Nearly 20 months after the senseless murder of his great aunt in her favorite park for a walk. And it broke my heart all over again. I gave him a big hug and told him, let's sure hope that isn't what happened to her. Noema was hands down one of the sweetest souls I knew. She was my favorite family walking buddy and she could crack me up when she'd ask, do you want to walk on the dirty road instead of just the dirt road near the farm? We'd catch each other up on family and friends we were praying for, and once she told me a story I shared with her gave her chicken bumps instead of goose bumps. She and my daughter loved to knit and crochet together, and she was always excited about any new craft projects happening in the family, and her flan was a Graber family favorite. Noema was a constant ray of sunshine in all of our lives, and we are all better people for having known and being loved by her. I loved her rock-solid faith and so admired the strength and peace it provided for her in the difficulties of life. She was a mighty prayer warrior and well, as always, looking on the bright side of every situation. She made everyone feel like you were part of her family, and she had an encouraging, positive word no matter what was going on. I'm sure she was the same incredible pillar of light in all areas of life, be it family, church, work, or community. The loss we have all suffered has been a major significance because of this horrific, evil crime that snuffed out a cherished daughter of the Most High God. I pray her soul fled straight to heaven the very moment her precious head was struck. I had never personally known anyone to be murdered in my 60 years of life, and I will never be able to understand or wrap my head around murder being a legitimate option for bad grades, or how you could ever talk a peer into doing something so heinous to your teacher. It's left me feeling much more cautious and leery going to and from work, running errands, and even taking my grandsons on outings to the parks. What breaks my heart most of all, though, is that you have absolutely robbed her and her three children of their precious mother. She will not be there for any more of their life events, especially their weddings and future grandchildren she would have cherished. Yet these same children choose to forgive you immediately, while most of us were still in a stage of shock. Again, this is an enormous testament to who Noema was and the incredible, incredible job she did raising her children. Forgiven people, Christians, are forgiving people. And her children have been the epitome of this. By the grace of God, we will follow their lead because we do not want you to take any more from us than you already have. We will live to honor her memory and love her children in her absence. The one thing that carries me through the toughest days is the hope of heaven and knowing we will be reunited one day in, in glory where there will be no more tears, pain, or suffering for anyone who repents and believes in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. This would have been a daily heart desire of Noema that everyone she knew would come to this life changing relationships with a personal savior, including all of her students. To me, a fair sentence would be 50 years, which would have you released at the same age Noema was when you horrifically took her life. You easily robbed her of several decades she would have enthusiastically relished with her husband and children and future grandchildren, memories none of them will have the opportunity to make now. 
The enormity of this loss cannot be measured by her family, friends, and community members. But we will all strive to live our lives in ways that will honor Noema's devotion and service to all, and for such a beautiful example of a life well lived. Um, the next statement I'm going to read is from Sean Braver, who is Noema's brother-in-law. Noema's absence has created a very adverse effect for not only our family, but the community as well. She was a loving wife and mother for our brother Paul and his family. She assisted Paul with his health concerns and provided wealth for her family. Since her absence, Paul's health has had remarkably declined with him passing away recently. We as a family believe he'd have lived a longer, more fruitful life if she was still present. Her son Christian has had to make significant work changes as a result as to help his family. Our family, in addition, has felt a significant loss from her absence, from her loving presence. She was an integral part of our unit. The community has felt a significant loss, and conclusively, many had an adverse effect from her absence, from a noticeable decline in morale and mental health in many. I've noticed this from my present work in the mental health field. She impacted even more residents than we have known, learning so after her death. Thank you for your help in this matter. The next statement I'll be reading is from Alberto Castillo, which is Noema Graver's brother. It is not about vengeance, like my nephews and niece said. We forgave him. This is about justice, and that is what we expected. When all this started, my feeling about this country's society, where nobody is killing each other, where everybody is killing each other, was a pure rejection. My point of view changed when I talked and spent time with the Fairfield community. The school and the neighbors, they all made me realize what an amazing person my sister was with the whole community. The way she helped and the way she loved and carried, cared and how everyone loved and cared for her made me change my point of view again. I realize that the actions of a couple of people do not represent the majority of a community. Personally, I feel a great void, emptiness because of her absence. This absence left me without the chance of spending time with my oldest sister, the sister that took the role of mother when ours passed away. My heart is heavy for my brother-in-law and my nephews and niece they had taken from them the most important part of their lives. But we have to move on with our lives, and only time will tell how we have moved on. And the last statement I'm going to read is from Socorro, who is Noema's sister. Your Honor and members of the court, this is not a good situation, nor your position. Even though I don't know you, I pray for you. As a Mexican, you come to this country and try your best. I know my sister did. I know this because when I attended her memorial, I listened to what the community had to say about her, her students, and all the people that knew her. They all gave me the opportunity to know my, who my sister was. She was devoted to the people around her. She was the kind of person that, you, that would spend her time just talking to the elderly, the kind of person who encouraged fellow immigrants that felt lost in this country. Without a doubt, my sister was an incredible human being. I know that she always did her best. I saw it every time I visited her. She completed her master's while she was already married and with children in a country and language that was not hers. My sister loved Mexico and proudly taught Spanish language to her students. In her classes, she would show her students the many different faces that the Mexican cultures have. This way, she would inspire her students to visit Mexico. She was a great neighbor, 
friend, and sister. She would help the Latin community to not give up and to always try their best. She was loved by anyone who knew her. She was very spiritual and respectful of all other religions. I think that your country has also lost a wonderful human being, a woman who transmitted peace, love, and respect. Dear Judge, I hope you take all the arguments in consideration and come to a just sentence. Judge, we have one more uh, victim impact statement. That's Christian Graber, who is the son of Noema. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank you all for giving me the moment to speak here. Um, I want to keep this kind of short because I'd like to get home soon, but I want to talk to you directly, Chayden. I've got no hate in my heart for you, and I've met your mother on several occasions and we had good conversations. She seems like a decent woman, and I'll always treat her with kindness and respect. And I met your grandmother yesterday uh, before the funeral of my father. And we had decent conversations. And I feel sorry for you. And I really feel sorry for your mother, your grandmother, and all your family. They seem like decent people. And I still think that there's potential for you to become a decent person as well. I don't see it at the moment, but I really hope that one day you can be. And I'd be very happy to help you to become a good person. And Two one a um, Mr. Miller, I've considered all the sentencing options provided for in chapters 901, uh, chapters 902, and 907 of the Iowa Code, and my judgment relative to sentence is based on um, the 25 factors I'm required to consider for you um, under the uh, Iowa Code for sentencing juveniles uh, to first degree murder. Um, primarily, I'm looking at um, rehabilitation and protection from the community um, from further offenses like this by you and others. And in selecting a sentence for you, um, I've considered um, your age, and I'll go in depth with that, the contents and the pre-sentence investigation, the pre plea agreement reached by the parties, and um, in sentencing you, um, since you were a juvenile when you committed this crime, the sentencing requires me to um, conduct a more thorough uh, finding out of sentencing pursuant to Iowa Code 902.122. And I've considered all those circumstances um, and decided that um, first you're gonna have to be uh, required to submit to a DNA sample that's required for all felony convictions. Um, I've considered your, uh, the, the brutal nature of this offense um, but also in line with the minutes of testimony of the case, along with the entire court file. And uh, I also find that the restitution amount, I'll give the county attorney 30 days to file pecuniary damage statements for all the restitution 
That's not the $150,000 restitution that is required in this case. And I will order that you shall pay to the heirs of Milhaina Graber $150,000. That will be to the estate of Milhaina Graber or to her heirs jointly and severally liable with Jeremy Goodale. And I'll order that you're presumed to have the ability to pay a Category B restitution and that you have the opportunity to request a termination on that at a later time. Mr. Miller, this is a lengthy record that I'm going to make, but I'm just going to go down the list here and tell you what I have to consider, not just from this case law, State v. Roby has been talked about, State v. Lyle. I think State v. Majors was the recent one that was discussed by your attorneys. The legislature codified these factors under 902.122. The first factor that I consider is the impact of the offense on each victim. And the victim impact statements, including the victim impact statement, may include comment on the sentence of the defendant. We have just heard that. But this factor I find to be an aggravating factor in determining your sentence. Your horrific actions led to the death of Nahima Graber, and her family will never be able to fill that void. The victim impact statements remind us all of the pain the family and friends of Nahima Graber will carry with them forever. The second thing I consider is the impact of the offense on the community. I also find this to be an aggravating factor. The entire Fairfield community has been shaken by the senseless premeditated murder of one of its beloved teachers. I think that came through pretty strongly with Chief Kinsella's testimony. And that you, along with Mr. Goodale, are accountable for that detrimental impact on the community. The threat to the safety of public and any individuals posed by you, the defendant, I find this also to be an aggravating factor to the extent that any individual who would plan and participate in a murder based on an unsatisfactory grade is an individual that will require immense rehabilitation. And there was some discussion about a mandatory minimum. I am going to issue a mandatory minimum on this case. If I gave the Board of Parole the option to release you without a mandatory minimum, it would be contrary to the public safety of the community you would reside in and to the residents of the community you reside in. There was some discussion about there being an expert to impose a mandatory minimum that most normally would be a matter for expert testimony. This is far from a normal case. And to the extent the mandatory minimum is an issue, I think the facts and circumstances of this case demand it. And I would not be doing my job if I didn't impose some sort of mandatory minimum. The degree of participation in the murder by you is another factor I consider. It's an aggravating factor. The reason that Nohama Graber was murdered was because you were unhappy with your grade. But for your thoughts, planning, and acts, Nohama Graber would still be alive. Mr. Miller, you and Mr. Goodell committed premeditated murder of your teacher. It was carried out in one of the most horrific fashions one could imagine, which goes to the nature of the offense, which is an aggravating factor. Planning the murder by stalking Ms. Graber, her walking route, bringing supplies such as a wheelbarrow and a baseball bat, 
that beating the victim lifeless is a horrific act. It calls for swift justice, deterrence, and accountability. With regard to your remorse, you waited to today to show some sort of remorse uh, that, uh, for the act you and Mr. Goodell committed. I find that you downplayed your role in this homicide based on your admissions and the minutes of testimony and the evidence presented in this sentencing hearing. It's an aggravating factor. Uh, state's witness, Talon Sissom Fane, a fellow classmate of yours, uh, who you told that you caught a body with a baseball bat. While the defendant is remorseful for his current situation, there has been little remorse shown by Mr. Miller for Naima Graver, her family. I think State's Exhibit 131 shows the extent of the premeditation to finalize the win or secure a victory when describing the murder of the defendant that you and uh, the murder that you and the defendant, uh, Jeremy Goodell, committed. Acceptance of responsibility, I actually find to be a mitigating factor. Uh, Mr. Miller, I find by you pleading guilty, you spared the victim's family, witnesses in the Fairfield community, a protracted trial where the details of this brutal act would be recounted. With regard to the severity of the offense, including the following, uh, the commission of the murder while participating in a felony, the number of victims, the heinous, brutal, cruel uh, manner of the murder, including whether the murder was the result of torture. Uh, to the extent the court is to consider there only being one murdered victim as opposed to several, I, I consider that a microscopic mitigating factor. The overall heinous, cruel, and painful murder is an enormous aggravating factor. Next factor the court has considered and is placing on the record is the capacity of the defendant to appreciate the criminality of his, his conduct. And I do find this to be a mixed factor. Um, case law requires me to account for your immature brain uh, while committing this crime. Uh, most of the science I'm familiar with states that a human being's brain isn't fully developed to their 25. Certainly based on your immaturity, you did not likely think too deeply about what happens to individuals who plan and execute a murder. Uh, you knew what you were doing. Whether you appreciate, appreciated how wrong it was raises an urgent rehabilitation flag for me. Deterrence and rehabilitation require the court to sentence you to a lengthy prison sentence. The next factor I've considered is whether the ability to conform with the defendant's conduct with the requirements of the law was substantially impaired. And again, to the extent that being a 16-year-old high school student impairs your ability to comply with the law, I find this to be an aggravating factor. Um, there's no indication you had any issues prior to November 2021 complying with the law or societal norms. The next factor I consider is the maturity uh, of the youth, the defendant, Mr. Miller. It's a mixed bag because it is a mitigating factor that you were 16 when you committed this crime. However, uh, you're also an intelligent young man. Both the Iowa State Supreme Court and the Iowa, uh, both the United States Supreme Court and the Iowa Supreme Court have held that juveniles are constitutionally different than adults for the purposes of sentencing. That's another verse, Alabama, state for sweet. In the state first sweet case, it was a 4-3 Iowa Supreme Court case that held that juvenile murderers cannot be sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. The United States Supreme Court held in the Miller case uh, barred life in prison and without the possibility of parole for all but the rarest of juvenile offenders, those whose crimes reflect permanent incorrigibility. I also cite Montgomery versus Louisiana. I think you're very fortunate, Mr. Miller, that the state of Iowa does not allow the option of life without the possibility of parole, because that would have been a serious consideration for me if I had that option. Next factor I consider is the intellectual and mental capacity of the defendant. And again, it's aggravating. Mr. 
you're an aggravating factor, you're a very bright and intelligent man, you committed an evil crime. The nature and extent of the prior juvenile delinquency or criminal history of the defendant is an X factor the court considers, including the success or failure of previous attempts at rehabilitation. So again, this is a mitigating factor to the extent that you did not have a previous criminal record and you are a good candidate for rehabilitation. However, um, some of the things reported to by the South Iowa Area Detention Service Agency regarding some warnings and consequences for various infractions of inappropriate comments or unnecessary horseplay or verbally assaulting another juvenile with the threat of violence, these things, um, arguing with staff, you know, that sort of misbehavior. Certainly some of it can be attributed to your age, uh, but I think it just shows that you're just starting your journey towards rehabilitation. Following factor I've considered as well is now health history of the defendant, Mr. Miller. By all accounts, I don't see if there's any mental health issues for you uh, in your record. The next factor the court considers and makes record of the level of compulsion, duress, or influence exerted upon the defendant, but not to such an extent as to constitute a defense. Uh, this is an aggravating factor uh, just because you're it was your plan to kill Nohem McGregor, and you recruited Jeremy Goodell based on uh, the evidence and the minutes of testimony. Next factor that the court considers is the likelihood of the commission of further offenses by you, Mr. Miller. In determining what sentence to impose, this factor is difficult to weigh. Um, but with the amount of time that you'll be incarcerated, it is my hope that you will not only have time to reflect on your actions, but to also grow as a person. You're naturally doing it um, physically right now, but I'm talking about mental maturity. I believe that uh, you're currently a threat to the community based on this planning and executing of the murder with Jeremy Goodell. But with the programming and maturing in the Iowa prison system, beginning with the youth role offender uh, program that was discussed earlier, I believe that you have the ability to avoid committing further offenses because uh, mandatory prison sentences are great deterrents for human beings. The next factor I've considered is the chronological age of the defendant the features of youth, including immaturity, impetuosity, impetuosity, and failure to appreciate risks and consequences. And this is generally a mitigating factor for you, Mr. Miller. You were a minor when you committed this crime. The law treats you as an adult for the purposes of prosecution. But at sentencing, the law requires me to consider your immaturity, the your impetuousness, failure to appreciate risks and consequences in determining the appropriate sentence. Um, you thought, I believe, as all criminals do, but you certainly naively that you could avoid legal consequences by being coy or pointing fingers at others. Certainly, uh, your failure to appreciate the consequences played a role in your teacher's death. While this particular case also shows that planning that went into the murder, uh, it does also show your impulsivity um, to, to reduce a small portion of the mandatory minimum time that I'm going to impose uh, or would otherwise impose on a first degree murder case. At some point, um, some of your traits will be difficult to alter, but um, it is not impossible through rehabilitation. Uh, I was troubled when I read that you reported you believe you have a higher IQ than most of the staff at the South Iowa Detention Service Agency. Uh, this sort of arrogance is sometimes a reflection of youth, other times it's just your personality. And the arrogance is troubling to me, and I, I find um, on the record that that Arrogance is um, not primarily due to age, but 
to an intellectual superiority mindset. The next factor I've considered is family and home environment that surrounded the defendant, which is neither an aggravating nor mitigating factor. With regard to the next factor, that's the competencies associated with youth, including but not limited to the defendant's inability to deal with peace officers or the prosecution, or the defendant's incapacity to assist the defendant's attorney in the defendant's case. Uh, I do not find this to be a mitigating factor. You've been zealously represented by experienced and talented attorneys and have been able to present a very thorough defense. Next uh, factor I've considered is the possibility of rehabilitation. And the court finds this mostly to be a mitigating factor. Uh, the years that you will spend incarcerated will allow you to learn skills, uh, I guess GED or high set and beyond, depending on how far you want to take it, Mr. Miller. Most importantly, reflect on the immense harm you did to Nelham and Graber, Graber, her family, and the Fairfield Island community. Um, and then there's a last uh, consideration I've been considered as required by the case law and the statute. With any other information that I've considered, um, in my sentence, um, in, in recent years, the Iowa Supreme Court has attempted to find an adequate model approach in juvenile sentencing and compliance with Article 1, Section 17 of the Iowa Constitution, ban on cruel and unusual punishment. It's the Eighth Amendment in the Federal Constitution. I mentioned the state or sweet decision earlier that held that life without the possibility of parole for juveniles is uh, unconstitutionally cruel and, and unusual according to that 4-3 Iowa Supreme Court case. Um, in the case your attorney cited earlier, State Review Majors, Justice Waterman wrote, our earlier opinions have been criticized for running the risk of making it difficult, if not impossible, or a sentencing judge to ever impose any minimum term of incarceration. Yet, as we indicated in Roby, mandatory minimum sentences are permissible, while there is a presumption against minimum terms of incarceration for juvenile offenders, we have expressly held, even commanded, their use if court concludes that sentence is warranted after consideration of the factors. And those factors are what I just went through, Mr. Miller. And based on recent Iowa precedent, I'm not allowed to consider a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole, which is permissible in most other jurisdictions. Certainly a high school junior who formulates a plan, <clears throat> or high schooler that formulates a plan with his friend and uh, murders a Spanish teacher is a dangerous person to the community. Um, the definition of malice is the intention or the desire to do evil. And evil does not have a birthday. This court cannot overrule precedent. However, I will not gloss over the fact that you and Mr. Goodell cut Nohama Graber's precious life short. That would not be justice, regardless of your age, Mr. Miller. The bedrock of our criminal justice system is deterrence and rehabilitation. And ultimately, while acknowledging your youth and developing brain, I find that your intent and actions were sinister and evil. Those acts resulted in the intentional loss of human life in a brutal fashion. There's no excuse. There is not a systemic societal problem that explains or justifies your actions. The 
court finds, based on the nature and circumstances of this offense, along with the required 25 factors that I have to consider in sentencing a juvenile in the state of Iowa for murder in the first degree, that the defendant, Willard Noble Chayden Miller, should be sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 35 years. This sentence is permissible under the Iowa law. A 35-year mandatory minimum is not cruel and unusual punishment for the defendant as it represents the appropriate time of incarceration for the defendant and Mr. Goodell's premeditated murder. It is further ordered that the Iowa Medical and Classification Center in Oakdale, Iowa, is designated as a reception center to which the defendant is to be delivered by the sheriff of this county. The defendant is given credit for all time served on this charge, including any juvenile detention center. To the extent that it doesn't apply to the mandatory minimum, Iowa Code Section 90159, Mr. Miller, does allow your term of incarceration to be reduced because of statutory good conduct time or credits, program credits, and you may be eligible for your parole after your mandatory has been served. You will have that opportunity to see the parole board and have good time credit at that time. You have the right to appeal your guilty plea, but your attorney must file a written notice of the appeal within 30 days, and we talked about waiving that right at the guilty plea sentencing. If you do want to attempt to challenge your guilty plea, there is an application for permission under Iowa Code Section 81429. The appellate court is to determine whether the application is granted or denied or preserved for post-conviction relief. Regarding your sentence, if you're only appealing your sentence, your attorneys must file a notice to the Iowa Supreme Court within 30 days, serve the written notice of the taking of that appeal upon the Jefferson County attorney, and file the same with the clerk of court together with evidence of that service upon the county attorney, and you must mail or deliver a copy to the Iowa Attorney General's office. The service and the filing of the written notice of appeal in a time and manner just specified is jurisdictional, and a failure to comply with such requirements shall be deemed a voluntary waiver of your right to appeal. You may be entitled to court-appointed counsel to represent you on your appeal and the preparation of these proceedings at state expense. Judgment accordingly, minimus accordingly, and immediately, no bond on appeal. Counsel, for the record, we need to make a sentencing hearing. I'm going to say just one thing, Judge. I know he will go to the youthful offender unit, I believe, in Oakdale. I don't know if your order needs to specify that specifically or not. I just thought of that a minute ago, so just to put that on your radar. But otherwise, nothing else. My understanding is they'll automatically send him there when he gets there. Any further record from the defense? No, Your Honor. That concludes the hearing.